Welcome to Club Doom, where I be feeling nostalgic, so I figured I'd make a quick compilation of my Sonichu review series. It won my personal favorite projects, and considering I had to cancel a video this month, I figured it'd make the perfect substitute. So if you happen to be one of the subscribers who ain't seen it yet, cause you newer to the channel, and this project been done since 2022, get yourself some popcorn, or your snack of choice, and a drink that won't hurt too much if you squirt it out your nose. Cause I can say from experience, some of the buffoonery Chris Chan write in this comic be so out of pocket that I can almost guarantee there will be at least one point where you squirt your drink out your nose. So without any further ado, here's my commentary series dating back to early 2021, where I review Sonichu, the electric hedgehog Pokemon. Sweet Nectar. I have a problem. On one hand, I am morbidly curious what exactly happens in the infamous Pokemon X Sonic crossover fan comic known only as Sonichu. On the other hand, I really don't want to read it. I mean, come on, it looked like ass. Th this ain't no Watchmen, this ain't no Steel Ball Run, no The Killing Joke, even if it does appear to be just as terrifying at times. So, I figured, fuck it. There's probably a good handful of people out here that feel the same way I do. So, let's speed run this shit. Let's make a series covering the Sonichu lore so people can save themselves the trouble of having to actually read this bullshit. Using the good old Wikipedia, an entire website dedicated to Chris Chan's fails, and... Goddamn, it, it is extensive! Let's set the mood. It is the mid-2000s, new metal is still popular for some godforsaken reason, Epic Games still gives a shit about Unreal Tournament, and the internet has been making leaps and bounds with new innovative websites such as MySpace and Dailymotion. <laughs> In fact, you had just gotten done watching the newest episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! The Abridged Series, and you are hungry for more well-made fan content of your favorite childhood anime. So, you go digging. Maybe you'll find something Sonic X related, or Pokemon related. That's when you stumble upon Sonichu number zero. <laughs> and oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> episode one, Sonichu's origin. Apparently there's a male Pikachu just chilling in the fields when he notices when he notices something happening five miles away in Station Square. Turns out it's Sonic in perfect chaos throwing hands like in the end of Sonic Adventure 1. Sonic gets his shit smacked and flies into the Pikachu. Upon impact, there is a rainbow hit confirm effect right out of Tekken that's so big it straight up mutates the Pikachu into an abomination. The Pikachu, being salty that he just got turned into yet another shitty Sonic recolor, understandably, vanquishes perfect chaos and the crowd cheers, hooray. Oh, and meanwhile there's a Raichu that gets hit with the rainbow and turns into a Rosachu. Okay, groovy. About as bad as you'd expect. The plot is bland and contrived, Super Sonic's only here just so we can accidentally make the little bastards, and no one else from the Sonic canon is even there. So, yeah. Episode 2. Genesis of the Lovehawks. A week has passed since the events of the first episode. Sonichu realizes that he cannot sustain his new body with the average diet of a Pikachu, so he goes from town to town eating small children. Okay, that's not what happens, but it'd be funny. No, instead he goes around stalking women, specifically Rosachu. No, seriously, he follows her to her house and looks at her through the window <laughs> while in the bushes. It's creepy. Meanwhile, Rosachu's bitching that she can't find a girlfriend free boy. Her trainer says suggest dating a Dragonite named David, but Rosichu objects on the grounds that he too dumb a dick. Sonichu then knocks on the door and starts channeling his creator by e-begging. Rosichu, I guess having a thing for homeless people bring him in, and they begin bonding over stupid shit like Sonichu's lack of a favorite color and a couple days pass, the two fall in love, they make out by a lake, yada yada yada, and there's fireworks for some reason. Guess it's a holiday. Maybe it's Christian Love Day. <laughs> Given Chris's inability to ever get laid ever, this episode provides fascinating insight into how he believes romance is supposed to work. Boy, see grill. Boy, stock grill. Five minute grill <laughs> to make with boy. Also, there's an ad for Sonichu Advance. Cool. Episode three. Sonichu versus Nate Cirque. Alright, they at the mall now. Apparently Rosichu got a spending problem. I don't know what a former Raichu would want to compulsively buy, but okay. Sonichu complains about there being pickles in his burger, despite not ever asking for no pickles. Then a shithawk bursts through the window and takes Rosichu away. 
Guess Sonichu gonna have to ride on Moltres to save his wife, Rush Re I mean Rosichu. Okay, so we fight in Zapdos now. Sonichu kicks him, uses double team to take Rosie back, and zaps him. Nate Zerg vows revenge and then fucks off before the jerk ops can be called for property damage. Sonichu is then congratulated by Chris himself, who is the mayor of Quickville, and Sonichu responds by roasting him. <laughs> okay, I know that's not what Chris intended, but I can't help but think that with lines like, there he goes, with a grin on his face. In the end, he'll say, One girlfriend, please. <laughs> like, what a little dick. They talk about the Sonichu comic. Within the Sonichu comic, Sonichu makes what sounds like more jokes at Chris's expense. Then he starts calling him daddy for some reason, and the episode ends. Classic Sonichu strips. I don't think there's much to say about these. Uh, they're just a few pages of comics drawn before the actual making of the comic book series. Uh, let's see, we got 25 years into the future, Sonichu recycles a joke from XL Saga, there's one where uh, Rosichu is busy being beautiful and confesses she hates working. Uh, Sub episode one, Christian Chandler and the jerk op catastrophe. A little context before we get into this one. Christian back in the day was on what he called a love quest where it, you would try to find a girlfriend by, and I shit you not, making a sign saying he was a virgin and required a beautiful white girl with a job. He would fucking bring this out to public places like the Walmart and his college campus. Unfortunately, due to the fact that we really do be living in a society, uh, very often uh, store managers and <laughs> mall security were called to escort him out of the establishment. <laughs> He would refer to these poor people just trying to do their fucking job as jerk ops, manager jerks, and jerk -eefs. And they would be major antagonists throughout the run of Sonichu. I may have been paraphrasing off of the quickie before, but I really, I really gotta like just fucking read this out to you because I, I can't do this shit justice. Oh, hey, Cheddar. We, we, we doing a video on Sonichu lore. Come get a, come get a fucking, <laughs> come here. Yeah, we're, yeah, dude, come on, come on up, come on up. You gotta, you gotta hear about, uh, one of the episodes from the fucking, <laughs> from the fucking first issue. Sub episode one, Christian Chandler in the jerk off catastrophe. The jerk off catastrophe. Let me just read this to you off of the quickie. All right. One year and seven months into Christian's love quest, he ponders his lack of progress while listening to music on his Nintendo DS. Just then, the enormously fat black jerky towers over Chris, rightfully calling him out and accusing Chris of soliciting sex. Chris is outraged by this correct assessment of his actions and valiantly defends his honor. The jerk thief summons his jerk ops to handcuff Chris, but his keen tactical mind allows him to spot his assailant and dodge them, somehow causing the jerk op to handcuff his own hands. Chris kicks the jerk op in the dick and backhands another jerk op square in the face, giving him enough breathing room to transform into Chris Chan Sonichu, which is like where he turns and morphs into a Sonichu. <laughs> The just, jerk just goes Super Saiyan form, right? No, super, yeah. Super Chew form, right there. Yeah. Uh, the Jerky responds by summoning his metal armor, which only gets a TikTok clock panel rather than a full transformation scene, and a pitched battle begins. <laughs> Chris Chen uses Mega Kick, Double Kick, Miracle, and Thunderbolt to disarm the Jerky, and honorably offers mercy to his defeated foe. But the jerk keep is without honor. Defiant to the end, he fires a handgun at Chris, <laughs> who, who uses a barrier to deflect the pitiful attack. 
his enemy beaten, Chris decides to unleash his special ultimate attack, the dreaded Kamehameha, which is which is a thing Chris would actually do, where we would do Kamehameha motions and yell Kamehameha, and the whole point of it is he was supposed to be cursing them. Like, he, he genuinely thought that this would curse people and cause misfortune upon them. The jerk heap initially feels no adverse effect and rises to fight back, but the curse soon sets in. He, he, and I shit you not, he slips on a banana peel, breaks his glasses, and learns his wife just divorced him over his smoking habit and is taking custody of the kids, the house, and everything he owns. The jerk heap's life is shattered, and Chris makes sure he knows that he deserved all of it. The jerk heap cries, my soul hurts. Oh my god. Chris-chan truly is, uh, the leader of the loiter squad. <laughs> oh my god. Alright, analysis. This is the first, though certainly not the last time, Chris would use his comic to create bizarre power fantasies in which he was victorious in events he was not in real life. <laughs> Sub-episode 1, along with other sub-episodes, is reprinted in Sonichu number 4. <laughs> Note that the jerk eve is black. Also note that Chris misspelled the title, spelling catastrophe as ta- Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh my god. And that is Sonichu number zero, the first officially published comic in, in the Sonichu lore. We're gonna be trying to go through all these- There are fucking up to 17 issues of Sonichu. Now, not all of them have been released. I don't think 16 and 17 are fully released. We're gonna be talking about the issues, we're gonna be talking about the characters such as Sonichu, Rosichu, uh, Black Sonichu, as well as some of the, uh, some of the villains like Mary Lee Walsh and oh, <laughs> Count Graduan. We're gonna do- forget Mary Lee Walsh. Oh, yes. So, that's gonna be a- <laughs> that's gonna be a fun time. So, if you like the idea of all this, please like, comment, and subscribe. And trust me, you're it's it's it only gets better from here. It only gets you're better from here. You're gonna want to hear this synopsis. Oh yeah, sweet nectar. Welcome to Club Doom, where we pretend to make Doom content, but most of the time we just laughing at Chris Chan. And we are continuing where we left off with a review of Sonichu issue zero. Like I told y'all, I am committed to this. I don't care if I end up in a freak accident and end up having to use an electro larynx. Sounded like Microsoft Sam up this bitch. When I say I'ma summarize the entire series, I'ma summarize the entire series. Dead ass. Uh. If you're new to the channel and you like what I make, you know what to do. So let's get into this. Fuck, what is the what is the chapter's name again? I forgot to write down the names of the chapter. <laughs> Episode 4. Black Sonichu in Darkness, Speed, and Lightning. Dr. Robotnik and Giovanni of Team Rocket have decided to join forces to destroy Sonichu for no fucking reason. This is revealed after Nate Sirk, who happens to be Giovanni's son, returns home with a semen sample he got from Sonichu during the fight in the last issue. I'ma just go with semen sample. This is all explained through text, meaning Chris just thought of this at the last second, so fuck it. The sample is to be used for a perfect Sonichu clone. Things don't go as planned, however, as Dr. Tenure over here spills cherry cola into the sample and decides to just put it in anyway. <laughs> like, fuck. No shits given must be his favorite holiday. As a result, the clone comes out black and they name him- Oh. Oh. Oh no. Oh no! <laughs> well, consider me cancelled. Guess I'm going to have to find some weird alt-right YouTube ripoff getting video recommendations where Varg talks about how much he loves playing the Nazis in COD World War II. Thanks, Chris! They then give him totally not Shadow the Hedgehog's rocket shoes so he can compete with Sonichu and then send him on his merry way with a slap on the bum. Analysis. Why is everyone in Team Rocket so prone to fucking up? I mean, who in HR is in charge 
charge of hiring these fuckwads. Whatever, it doesn't matter. We're moving on to episode five, Sonichu in informal meeting. All right, simple plan. Racy McRacehog is to kidnap Rosie and lure Sonichu into a trap. Using the enhanced speed inborn with his race, the dark-skinned creature strikes out at his betters and abducts the helpless, virtuous, fair-skinned woman, as is his nature. <laughs> Sonichu and Sonic collide with one another and the Spider-Man meme ensues. Rosichu awakens to the utter horror that she is no longer in the arms of her pure, cultivated man, but a thuggish black brute. She demands that he release her, but the crude, leering sub Sonichu refuses out of obligation to Massa. Hey, at this point, let's just be grateful it wasn't Grape Fanta that started all this. Hey, let's be grateful it wasn't Orange Fanta that fucking led to this. Sonic and Sonichu remember each other from the perfect chaos fight and they team up so they could save Rosichu and yeah, that's it. Analysis, Rosichu, despite being a Raichu, you know, which is stronger than Pikachu, has simply become nothing more than a mere damsel in distress for our Pikachu hero. So, yeah. And everything about Black Sonichu makes me unfucking comfortable, so let's try to end this as quick as possible. Episode 6, Sonic and Sonichu, Black Metal Combat. Alright, Rosie is put in a rubber-coated cage. Nate, Cirque, and Robotnik go over their plan, which is so simplistic I wouldn't be surprised if they just deadass stole this from Scratch and Grounder. There's this odd throwaway gag where Robotnik sings and dances and Chris breaks the fourth wall so he could laugh at it. I don't, I don't know, it's weird. Meanwhile, Sonic suspects that Dr. Robotnik might be involved, so he advises that Sonichu goes in alone while he stays behind as backup. Sonichu discovers Rosie along with Nate Sir Giovanni and Dr. Robotnik. Minstrel the Show Hog is then ordered to attack Sonichu and bait him into a position so Robotnik can lower the moon bong. Sonic intervenes and Robotnik reveals his contingency plan, which is Metal Sonichu. Sonic frees Sonichu and they use the moon bong to get the mechanical head hedgehog baked out of his goddamn metal skull. The two hedgehogs perform a zap cannonball attack, which launches Metal Sonichu through a wall, up a mountain, and to the goddamn moon. Some real battle tendency shit right here. Sonichu then frees Rosichu with a spin jash. With a spin jash. With a <laughs> Sonichu frees Rosichu with a spin dash. <laughs> This took me 10 fucking takes, I don't know why. Rosichu then walks up to Black Sonichu and punches his teeth out, making him look like a fucking Pantera album cover. Why she couldn't have done this or the spin dash before, I don't fucking know. In the epilogue, Rosichu and Amy Rose meet at the mall and they have girl talk about things like clothes, shows, and TikTok videos, oh my god. I'm not even gonna bother with the analysis, I just fucking love that they fucking launched the thing to the moon. And now time for the real reason why everyone is here. Sub episode two, Christian Chandler in The Rise and Fall of My Heart. Time for the spicy shit, boy. This legendary installment dramatizes the real life incident in which Chris was trolled by a girl at the mall during his love quest. Basically, while Chris is at the mall enjoying some chicken tendies, a girl named Hannah walks up to him noticing his sign and asks if he wants to get coffee. Fast forward to the Starbucks 15 minutes before the date, Chris relays the good news to Rosachu, who is also at the mall, because when is she not at the fucking mall? During the date, Chris pulls out a pen and paper as if he's giving a job interview or some shit. Also during the date, she asks Chris about his medallion and scrapbook of fail, which I'm sure she almost instantly regretted. Later that day, Rosichu overhears Hannah and her friends talking about how she was pretending to like Chris as a prank conceived by her bo her boss. Her boss? What fucking employer is making their employees go out and prank autistic dudes at the mall? She must be interning at 4chan or some shit. Rosie, apparently never learning the phrase, snitches get stitches, tells Chris what's really going on. Christian then confronts Hannah, and she admits to everything. Chris pushes on, insisting that she must have nonetheless come to appreciate him during their date. Hannah's answer is a stark and unyielding no. This leads to the legendary real-life moment where Chris deadass screams, No! 
the middle of the mall and ends up getting kicked out. Smooth. Chris then composes a quite lengthy email towards Hannah, which goes a little something like this. Hannah, I just wanted to say that I appreciated you being the first to approach and say anything to me. I get very nervous, so I was hoping for that to happen. Also, I appreciated you taking the time to chat with me at the Starbucks. And I was very elated, excited and butterfly heart full from the positive events. But it was not very nice for you to have led me on like that just to pull a prank on me. I was terribly hurt. Before you stepped into my world, my heart was previously shattered due to previous events and it was 20% repaired. After you came in my heart had shattered back to 15%. There is a lesson to learn through this. Never make a joke, or prank, at the expense of another person's feelings and emotions. But still, after cooling off, I also want to say that I thought that you, Anna, looked very pretty. I enjoyed your charming wit and personality. And I thought of you as a nice lovely girl. If you should ever change your mind on how you feel about me, you may look me up. But please tell me two things in your reply. You don't smoke, do you? That stuff really turns me off. Are you boyfriend free? Sincerely, Christian W. Chandler. Penis. You may take this as a clue, but keep in mind that I did graduate from high school with honor roll. I did make good grades at PVCC. You may want to look up blank in a search. And that is issue one. That was 10 times more painful than issue zero. I'm hoping they don't get progressively worse as time goes on, but they probably do. Because now I'm committed, so if you'd like to see me torture myself more please be sure to type no in the comments and also like and subscribe sweet nectar welcome to club doom where i have to take gameplay footage from frame raider because i fucked up my hands if you thought you knew the meaning of the word petty before you ain't no jack shit until you read sonichu issue number two this has to be the pettiest Bullshit I have ever read through <laughs> For you see this is when Christian started Really implementing the whole real-life scenarios and real-life people thing <laughs> You know we saw bits and pieces of it through the sub episodes, but now it's starting to really bleed into the overarching plot and it's <laughs> Oh god. I am making it my mission to review every issue of Sonichu, so if you like the idea of that, please comment. You don't have to tell me twice, but during the Stone Age in the comments. Also like and subscribe. Here we go. Episode 7. Sonichu in Ancient Prophecy. Sonichu discovers the Destiny Cave, which low-key sounds like it could be a bro job song. Get on that, guys. This old dude, the keeper of the Destiny Cave, tells him that only the creature and his master of prophecy may enter. But the old dude then recognizes Sonichu as aforementioned creature and tells him to bring Chris over here so he can unlock his special power. You know, despite Christian already being shown to have powers. Guess this is a prequel to sub episode one. So get this, because IRL Chris once thought he was like 2% Cherokee, he wrote this Yu-Gi-Oh ass bullshit where he was the reincarnation of a chieftain and that Sonichu's creation was part of something called the Ancient Prophecy. In order to fulfill the prophecy, Chris must take his Sonichu medallion made from Crayola fucking model magic and shove it up his eye. Wait, hold up, no, that happens later. Nah, he must place it on a pedestal in the center of the cave. Chris has a vision where he meets his great, great, totally not white Native American ancestor, Wait. Tom McDonald. White boy here warns Chris that a rival will soon be coming to shoot the fade. Chris then transforms into Chris Chan Sonichu. You know, like in sub episode one. Analysis. This is the precise moment that Sonichu stops being about Sonichu and ends up being about Chris. We have yet to reach peak fuckery. Episode 8, 
Christian Chandler in Chaos and Serenity. Wes Eisley, yes, the fucking magician, also has a vision of his past self, who is a member of the rival Wasabi clan. He tells Wes to perform skedaddle skadoodle, you now have a bent noodle on Chris. A girl named Sarah Hammer also experiences a vision, where she meets the queen of the Cherokee. So why the fuck these people even here? Well, as it turns out, Chris had a crush on Sarah, who was dating Wes at the time. This made him jelly, so Chris did what he always does, and made Wes an unlikable bastard in his comic, which will never stop being funny. Meanwhile, Sarah is depicted as a fair, understanding young woman. While training, Sonichu accidentally turns Chris back into human form. You know, right as Wes about to jump him. And we get this beautiful panel right here. Chris rambles on about how he was jealous of Wes for being with Sarah, while Wes, who is currently riding the high of turning into a super-powered hedgehog with the mission of ruling the world for his ancestor, couldn't give two tits about Chris's virgin status. And then, when you think it can't get any more pathetic, Chris references the Trail of Tears. You heard that right. This dumb, stank ass, wider than the White House, incel core i9 simp motherfucker makes a reference to a historic tragedy and makes it about some non-existent beef he had with a guy who was a magician all over a girl who probably didn't even know he existed. And then Chris writes Sarah being elated that he was jealous for her. <laughs> you see why this man had shards of Crayola fucking model magic shoved up his ass? You see why he got extorted for 6k? Like, I don't condone it. Those were terrible things that probably shouldn't have happened, but I think there's something to be said about cause and effect in all this. You know, but just, just just keep that in mind. The episode then manages to rip off at least four different anime before ending. Analysis. I think the fact that even the characters in your own comic series don't give a fuck about your love quest really says something. Also, apparently that joke is supposed to mean you would have to tell a caveman something twice because they're stupid. A lot of people are confused where Chris got this from, but my theory is he got it from the old Geico commercials at the time, remember? So easy a caveman can do it? I feel that falls within the timeline of when this was made and therefore like contextually makes sense in a weird way episode 9 chris chan sarama and wesley in the evil that stomped quickville sarah saves chris's ass and gives him the crown of the cherokee that he didn't own in the first place she then promptly breaks up with wes seeing as he just tried to throw hands with an autistic man child in public she then reminds everyone oh yeah there's a prophesized evil that we have to fight hold up wait a minute Three descendants of rival clans fighting an ancient evil. But this is just the plot of King of Fighters 97. Bullshit. How am I more pissed off about this than the whole Trail of Tears thing? <laughs> Nerd. They then fly off to fight a giant golem who is attacking Quickville. Here comes a new challenger. Mary Lee Walsh was the real life Dean of Student Affairs at PVCC who tore up Chris Chan's attraction sign telling him that this is not how one goes about finding a significant other. Chris took this altruistic advice and did fuck all with it, opting to write Walsh as an evil witch who wanted to make finding true love illegal in Virginia. <laughs> so here's the basic chemistry of the three main characters throughout the fight. Oh my goodness, Chris Chan! What do we do? Bosses need caps! Oh man, I'm in the friend zone! The fight has all the tension of a Little League baseball game. Get used to that. That's gonna be every fucking fight in this series. Sarah then turns out to have a new boyfriend, and Chris is all like, eh, about it. And then Chris goes on, like, a page-long tangent about how he used to swing on the swing set with Sarah. Remember, this is written by a 25-year-old at the time. Also, Hide and Seed has very dangerous implications considering who wrote this. Analysis. Remember when Sonichu was about Sonichu? Yeah, me neither. Sub episode 3. Christian Chandler and Sonichu in Witch Confront. I've taken many blows in my life, but the most devastating were the blows from that Mary Lee Walsh during the first months of my love quest. She intruded by destroying my advertisements shattered my heart 
hurt my soul and threaten to make me look bad. <laughs> Chris, you don't need any fucking help looking bad, just letting you know. She must be stopped before others feel her wrath. Despite his ancestor advising him to use his powers responsibly to protect the innocent, Chris Chan Sonichu commences an unprovoked invasion of Mary Lee Walsh's office at the private villa of corrupted citizens while she is stirring some potion in a boiling cauldron. <laughs> Chris Chan makes a token effort to suggest he's here for the safety of the public, but it's obvious he just here because he's salty that she tore up his sign saying he was a virgin. Let that sink in. Walsh scolds Chris to cut the corny Sailor Moon poses and do JoJo poses like a grown-up before attacking him with dark magic. Chris then counters with Thunderbolt and a bunch of other signature Pokemon moves no one cares about. Walsh then up and kicks <laughs> Christian in the balls and he transforms back into his human form. Nice. The witch comes to the stunning conclusion that Christian is Christian. <gasps> Who would have thought? Sonichu intervenes. I guess Christian has life alert or some shit. Christian recovers quickly, and together they deliver their final attack. Chris casts another curse ye hame ha, while Sonichu uses thunder, and the combined energy appears to destroy Mary Lee Walsh as she screams into oblivion. Or does she? And there we go. That's issue two. I don't know what to tell y'all. If you're watching this and you're like, this is cringe, I hate it. <laughs> it only gets worse. I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry, but uh, <laughs> it does not get any better. It gets worse. It gets scary worse. It gets like downright disturbing. So if you'd like to see more of this, you know what to do. Like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. Sweet nectar. Welcome to Club Doom, where my cat won't leave me the hell alone. Hey, kitty. Hey, froggy. What's up? Mm. <laughs> I'll play with you in a minute, okay? I gotta do the video. Gotta do my voiceover. And today we are going over issue three of Sonichu. I am committed to reviewing all of Sonichu, so if you like the idea of that, Please comment below who your favorite member of the Chaotic Combo is. Mine is none of them, because they suck. Also, be sure to like and subscribe. Here we go. Sonichu, baby, dream about dream come true. Philip, yeah, Philip, yeah, Philip, why are you so cringe? Why don't you listen to a real band like Mayhem? Shit the fuck up, Lillian, I'm listening to Disturbed! Hey, remember the rainbow from issue zero? Well, apparently I made a bunch of Sonichu eggs and threw them back in time because reasons. So now we got a whole Power Ranger cast of Sonichus to go over. Yay! That's what we needed, right? More Sonichu! More useless character, more Sonichu! Isn't it exciting? More fucking Sonichu! Yeah! Wild Sonichu. He's a green grass type Sonichu who doesn't do jack shit. Next. Bubbles Rosichu has the power of somehow being dumber than everyone else in the comic. That's quite an accomplishment, actually. Punchy Sonichu. Hey yo, I know people out here be talking bad shit about Dr. Seuss, but have you ever met my main King Chong. Asian stereotype knuckles over here? Angelica Rosichu. Raised by nuns, stalked by Chris. She is actually very similar to her creator in that she likes to maintain a veneer of piousness despite jerking in the church. Finally, we have Majachan, the purple overpowered douchebag who barely contributes to the plot. Think Beerus from Dragon Ball Super, only instead of being painfully unfunny, he's just regular unfunny. Also, he will go on to marry his dads. Both of them. At the same time. But that's later. Then we get an advertisement for MySpace. Chris only has one friend and it's Sonichu. How fitting. Analysis. The backstories of the chaotic combo are so boring, I didn't even bother to mention them in this segment, so there. <laughs> Episode 11. The chaotic combo in when hedgehogs meet. We are introduced to totally not Kazooie, no really you guys, who is the guardian of the legendary Master Sunstone. And Black Sonichu steals it. Oh well. 
<laughs> Those dark-skinned Sonichu, am I right? Kazooie makes chase trying to catch Blachu on his hoverboard. During the chaos, Black Sonichu managed to piss off everyone within a 20-mile radius, kind of like Chris whenever he posts on Twitter. All the Sonichu, including Sonichu himself, then gang up on the black man and beat him into a bloody puddle. We then get an ad for a mail-order girlfriend. 1-800-RIGHT-NOW. Yeah, just advertise the sex trade in your superhero comic. What could go wrong? Analysis. You know how Chris just blatantly stole a character? Well, get used to that. It happens a lot. And what is with Black Sonichu stealing things and getting lynched all the time? It's almost like Chris is trying to say something. Sub Episode 4. Christian Chandler in Mikatech. Yeah, you heard that right. We only get two regular episodes and a sub-episode this time. So this video might be short, but really that's just because I skipped through a lot of unnecessary bullshit. This is actually the longest issue so far, I believe. So anyway, we find Chris yet again loitering at the Walmart. He blames his inadequacy on all men everywhere for taking all the pretty girls for themselves. Because, you know, Women are just a resource for us to mine in Age of Empires so we can upgrade to the Castle Age, am I right? <laughs> the jerk cops are then in pursuit because it is illegal to find true love at the Walmart. We are then introduced to one of Chris's most infamous bad writing habits, in that he has the tendency to just take random shit from his own personal headcanon and just throw them haphazardly in the comic with no context or explanation, like this guy. Who the fuck are you? I guess he's supposed to be like Link and Sonic and shit. I don't fucking know. They then beat the jerk ops, Dark Bind, Sonichu dips, and Chris gives this inspirational speech. Now, as for you two, mana jerks, the pain that you both. <laughs> now, as for you two, mana jerks, the pain you both are feeling now should be punishment enough for going against me in my love quest for a boyfriend-free girl to love and trust. I do not care for your rules, either of you, or any male other than my father and myself. But let me make it perfectly clear that in my quest it is very hard for me to find a girl due to the infinitely high boyfriend factor. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I can't with this motherfucker. I fucking can't. And I do not want to risk getting punched in the face from a jerk. Also, since the ladies are unable to notice my person because they're mostly <laughs> shopping on the mines, I have to loudly spell it out. So please, just leave me alone if I love Chris! Don't you talk down to my employees, you son of a bitch. What? Who goes there? It is me. The Lightbringer. Welcome to Club Doom, where only the strongest will survive, because today we're getting a little competitive. Unlike the other Sonichu issue reviews, we're not doing our summaries, instead, we are doing Sonichu Love Quest Saga trivia today, because issue 4 consists of nothing but sub-episodes. So it's completely inconsequential. The word on sub. Sub episodes. Oh yeah. He's a hella sub. Chris is definitely a sub. So with me, I have cheddar cheese and beef. You might remember beef from the superhuman reaction video. And you will remember Chetta from that video of us sucking at a basketball video game. In front of me, I have a list of questions. <laughs> all relating to issue four and the sub episodes so are you guys ready get like a noise get either a noise on your phone or if you have like a soundboard or something or or just make a noise like if to start from where we left off last time who does chris sub into his aid after getting bodied by the walmart manager uh Oh yeah! Alright, Cheddar, you have the floor. 
He summons his quote unquote sister. Alright, what's her name? Oh. <laughs> Cheddar, I will give you half a point, but if 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 Beef can get this right, he gets a full point. <laughs> Beef, what is what is her name? <laughs> Yes, Crystal Weston Chandler. So Beef gets a point, and Cheddar gets half yes. a point. Point five points. There we go. How long does Chris shower after getting knocked into the soda fountain? Hint, it's one second longer than his usual showers. <laughs> uh, if I recall, three seconds. That's correct. Beef, you have two points. Cheddar, you are still at point five. Question number three. What is revealed after the Walmart manager is decapitated? Yes. All right, Beef, you have the floor. Um, I'm probably going to win in on this, but was it revealed that he was a transformer? Ooh, that is incorrect. All right, Cheddar. And now it's your turn. What What do you think? What is revealed about the Walmart manager after he is decapitated by Christian and Crystal Chandler? Oh, We're gonna be having a five second countdown. Five, four, wing it, three, Two. The his head was sentient. Hmm. Uh, oh, that, that, ah. Uh, I think I will give that to you because it is revealed that he is just a head in a jar and doesn't have an actual body. So I will give that to you. So that means. Yeah. It's revealed that the Walmart manager is actually just a head in a jar. And Crystal and Christian didn't know that. Meaning, they went ahead and decapitated him with the intent of just straight up murdering this man. Because he impeded on his love quest. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't you? No, wasn't. Exactly. Well, at least they got a good benefits package. Oh, not funny. <laughs> they do. <laughs> not funny. <laughs> Alrighty. Next question. What is the name of the PVCC in Sonichu Canon? Alright, Cheddar. The private fill of corrupted citizens. That's correct. Beef 2. Cheddar now has 2.5. What is the real life name of the PVCC? Oh God. Uh, Sorry, you're out of time. <laughs> okay, well, all right. The answer was Piedmont, Virginia Community College. When was Crystal's first appearance in the Sonichu canon? Hint: It's not in the fucking comics. It's actually from a real-life custom Pokemon card that he created. It was either a Pokemon card or a Yu-Gi-Oh card. Alright, I'm gonna have to give you half a point. Yeah. I'm gonna give you half a point because you said Pokemon first and it was a custom Yu-Gi-Oh card. Oh, So that means Beef gets 2.5. Cheddar gets 2.5. You are both tied now. Neck and neck. Why doesn't the jerk-off's hypno gun work on Chris? <laughs> All right, Beef. Why doesn't the jerk-off's hypno gun work on Chris? Um, if I recall, it was either due to the fact that Chris is quote unquote smart in the comics as compared to real life, or it was either due to the fact that he was good looking, I think. Well, 
due to the uncertainty of your answer, I'm gonna have to give you another point five. But yes, the <laughs> the Manajerx Hypno Guns do not work on Chris because they only work on quote unquote slow-minded individuals. Because I guess tricking yourself into breaking your own PS3 and getting catfished like seven times does not count as being slow-minded. Uh, you know, yeah, he's gotta be fast. I mean, his book is called The Quickie. <laughs> Quickie chain. I'm docking a point. You're getting Cheddar. I'm docking a point. You are getting... This is a question uh, that I actually have yet to answer in any of the prior videos, but it's still kind of relevant. Who is Count Graduon? He's based off of IRL Chris, Christian's graduation from high school, how it was compared to such a shit show. <laughs> exactly. Count Graduon is, in fact, the living embodiment of Chris's high school graduation sealed within a mystical staff. <laughs> because I guess Chris didn't get some award he really wanted for art or some shit. What is the state of Virginia's slogan in the Sonichu canon? So, in the comic, the Virginia's uh, slogan is, Virginia is for virgins. Exactly. Virginia is, in fact, for virgins. Why do you think Chris was born there? <laughs> Maybe if he was born more westward, he might have actually had a sister that he... <laughs> and he wouldn't, maybe he'd actually have a sister and maybe he actually wouldn't be a virgin. Not to say that that lifestyle would be any better. <laughs> what is the name of the police officer? Girlfriends or boyfriendless? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Another point, dog. Shut up, shut up, <laughs> shut up, shut up. I'm trying to take my Sonichu review series on YouTube seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get banned from the Discord basement. <laughs> Alright. Next question. <laughs> Alright, you two. Who do I have to take the Reddit gold from? What is the name of the police officer who arrested Chris in real life at Target back in July? Oh, I, have, I have July of 2005 right now. <laughs> July! <laughs> Yeah, who arrested Chris in Target back in July of 2005? <laughs> I forgot I wrote that. I don't know why my history is drawing a blank on this. Okay, so neither of y'all are getting a point, and the answer was Marcus Baggett. Uh, Officer Marcus Baggett. Or Baggett, or I don't, I don't know how it's pronounced. It's either Baggett or Baggett. I'm sorry, what was this? Next question. What is the jerk ops badge made of? I recall from sub episode six from issue four, he clarified that the badges were made out of crackers, while the main uh, jerk keeps badge was made out of wood, and he made a joke saying that he was he thought his badge was tasty or something. Yes, that's right. The jerk ops badges are made of graham cracker and paint. Meanwhile, the mana jerk's badge is just made of wood, yet he still tried to eat it anyway. Alright, next question. Who the fuck snitched on Hannah? It was Rose Chu. That's right, it was Rose Chu. Which sub-episode has the big phallic straw? Isn't it, in, isn't it in seven? Yes, that is right. The big phallic straw appears in sub-episode seven. So that gives. Cheddar, 4.5 points, so Beef has a measly pathetic 6. When Chris rejoices that his love quest is finally over, what is in the background? There are multiple answers for this question. Beef? Um, I believe a rainbow says his love quest is over. Yes, that's right, and for an additional 0.5 points, what's the up? Uh, ah, uh, you know what? Yeah, yeah, I guess so, I think that's fair. It'll give you a chance to cash up a bit. Does he have to? Because I think he, he had his full heart, and like at 100%, like a picture of it, shining. 
Yes, but was that in the background? What was in the background? There's the one background, which is the rainbow colors, but in a revised version of the issue, there's a different background. Oh, God. Uh, all right, I don't know what's in the revised one. All right, well, it's heaven, so fuck you. <laughs> Beef gets seven points. <laughs> And Cheddar is stuck with a little 4.5. Cheddar is stuck with a little 4.5 inch penis. Alright, next question. Why did the jerky's wife divorce him? Okay. His smoking habits. That's right. Alright, where does Mary Lee Walsh kick Chris? In the dick. Yes, Mary Lee Walsh in fact kicks Chris in these nuts. Ha! Got him! <laughs> I woke the cat up. Sorry, Froggy. I didn't mean to wake you up. Beef gets 8 points, and Cheddar has 5.5. So his wee wee's just a little bigger now. Uh, I'm an... Uh, I'm an eater. Yes. I'm an eater for <laughs> Beef is the president of the 8-inch club. Fuzzy Wuzzies get you hugs, Prickly Wicklies get you... Slugs. Yes! It is in fact slugs. Alright guys, real talk, is Scott Palazzo's name one word or two words? Uh, it is one giant word. What does Sonichu do instead of bathe his nasty ass? <laughs> If I recall from the advertisement from the issue, he uses Axe Body Spray. <laughs> That's right. He sprays all over himself with Axe Body Spray. You know, instead of cleaning out his ass, cleaning out his pits, cleaning off his feet, he j just mask it with Axe Body Spray. Alright guys, name three different locations that Chris has been loitering in. Mall, the mall, Walmart, and Target. That is right, he was at Walmart, Target, and Charlottesville Fashion Square Mall. So you get a point. Cheddar now has 6.5. Yeah, well, I'm beef. finally average. <laughs> Cheddar is finally at a normal person's <laughs> length. While Beef is living up to his name right here with an 11 dong. Alright, oh, 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 I love this one. I love this one. Why did Chris have to end the sub episodes? I'm gonna, I'm gonna fudge this up. I know I am, but I'm just gonna wing it and say it was because of his mother, right? Yes. Yes. Uh huh. The, the reason Chris had to end the sub episodes. Exactly. Yes. That is correct, Beef. The reason Christian had to stop making sub-episodes was because his mother told him to stop making <laughs> them <laughs> as they loosely <laughs> depicted unflattering events from Chris's life. <laughs> After Hannah's prank, what did Chris do which resulted in yet another ban at the Fashion Square Mall? Oh yeah! Yes, Cheddar? He, he made up the email. Ooh. Oh, I know, but I don't actually know. <laughs> Never mind, that no! That, that is wrong. Because he, in fact, yelled, No! Really loud in the middle of the mall. <laughs> then he wrote the email. Last question. What was Chris's master plan so that he could loiter in the target? Again, I'm gonna go on, on a wank here and say there was an open bar at Target and he just had his MP3 or DSL. That is part of what he did, but he had he had a devious plot behind exploiting that system. What was it? That, that I'm drawing a blank on, I'll be honest. Wasn't it like uh, hiding in the crowds or something like that? Uh, nope, nope, nope. I'm gonna do a ten. Dumb, I remember that. Alright, I'm going to do a countdown of ten, nine, eight, 
Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. The answer is Chris plans to pay a single dollar to receive a soda at their snack bar and exploit their free refill policy, which is usually meant for paying patrons who order food as well as a drink to keep refilling the same soda over and over again while he spent the entire day sitting there doodling his shitty characters and spying on women as they shopped, keeping his seat near the... near the exit. <laughs> Big brain. That, that was a... That, that's a solar system brain move right there. There's that quick thinking that gate made him immune to the ray. <laughs> He's quick on his feet. Alright, and with that, Beef won by a landslide with 12 points, and Chetta had an average size 6.5. So, congratulations, Beef. You won the... Sonichu Issue 4 Quickville Love Quest Saga Trivia. Um, I don't have a prize. I don't have a prize, cause at the end of the day, we're a bunch of dudes in our mid-twenties wasting our lives reading a shitty Sonic Pokemon fan comic drawn by an autistic man-child. We're all fucking losers. So join us next time when I attempt to read Ember's Ghost Squad or some shit. Or watch. This just made me feel depressed. <laughs> Welcome to Club Doom where oh my god they gave Blinks a scar and Blinks too. I'm so mad I'm gonna go mace a random GameStop employee. Now there's only one thing that could cheer me up and that's reading Sonichu issue 5. At this point in the writing of the comic, Chris has just been discovered by the internet and is currently obsessed with a girl named Megan whom he met at his local card game shop. And if you know anything about Chris Tree, you know that we are close to the tipping point. We are close to the point where Sonichu goes from being, you know, innocent, laughable, and stupid to just demented, depraved, and irredeemable. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. This is gonna be a fun train wreck to watch. That's for damn sure. <laughs> yeah. I want that soda pop, yeah. What can I grow with God, yeah. She on that photo shot, yeah. But that be a no-no, yeah. This club be so, so hot. So let's begin. Episode 12, Christian Chandler in My Friend's Cherokee Wedding. Sarah Hammer from Issue 2 is getting married to a Yu-Gi-Oh card. Congratulations. Chris's stank ass didn't get invited, so he has to astral project himself there. Guess he going to miss the garter to- Oh wait, no, I mean the bouquet toss. Alright, that's a thing. Uh, Wes pulls up, making him the second thirsty bitch who can't get over Sarah to just crash the wedding. Chris, while daydreaming about finger-banging Megan against her wishes, senses something is wrong and plays a trap card that makes Wes hear reason. Wes responds by firing a projectile into the air. Chris dodges and transforms into Chris Chan Sonichu. Wes, however, whoops his ass and kidnaps Sarah. Oops. Chris makes chase. Hey, Wes. Apple core. Baltimore. Who's your friend? Your mama my dick saying fuck you. Chris uses a Yu-Gi-Oh card, wrongly by the way, to steal Sarah back. Wes responds with a fireball, but it is reflected by Sailor Megtoon. And that guy. Hey yo, what the hell wrong with Sarah at this panel? <laughs> I feel bad for the Yu-Gi-Oh card marrying her. Her eyes all fucked up, she drooling and shit. She got Elvin Titus in the left arm. <laughs> Wes and Megtoon have a rock off before Chris puts Wes into a black hole. Back at the wedding, Sarah throws a bouquet to Chris and sends him off with a heartfelt goodbye. And with that, Sarah is officially written out of the story. So I guess the ancient prophecy ain't shit. Then we get my favorite line in the entire series. Virginia is for virgins. Isn't it beautiful? Episode 13. Smashed hearts and entrapment. 
Jerk-offs are running rampant assaulting random couples in Quickville as ordered by Mary Lee Walsh. Meanwhile, Chris and Sonichu are hanging out at the mall, giving me Cerebus the Aardvark flashbacks with all the damn text dumps. Like, come on, bruh. It is a graphic novel, visual novel, comic book. You're supposed to tell the story with the fucking panel. The local radio station reports how jerk-offs have been harassing couples all over the city, and there is currently a standstill between the jerk-offs and the real Quickville police force. The jerk ops are being led by Mary Lee Walsh and Count Graduan, who plan to entrap Chris in something called the Dark Mirror Hole. Upon the arrival of Chris and his little shitlins, Mary and Graduan summon Cad Chef, a teacher at PVCC who gave Chris an F. Nice. Also, apparently, he's a giant fucking robot. With the help of a reused panel of Sailor Megtune and that guy, they defeat the robot menace. Then all of a sudden, Count Graduan be like, I'm actually going to do something for once. And traps Chris in the dark mirror hole. But then, Mary Lee Walsh decides it'd be funnier if they just flipped the script and got Crystal stuck in there instead. Megtune then hugs Chris out of sorrow for losing Crystal, and Rosa Chu reminds us that this hug never really happened. <laughs> I swear these Sonichu are going out of their way to make fun of Chris. We are left on a to be continued, and with that ends Sonichu issue 5. Join us next time for the fu Oh shit, my Dreamcast geeking out! I need to turn off Facebook because I keep getting notifications on my computer and it keeps getting into the recordings. So there we go. Alright. It's issue six time, baby. You know the drill. Actually, you don't. Turns out, issue six only has like one to two episodes. I was getting some complaints before about how short the last one was because it was only five minutes. So you know what? We making it a double feature, boy. Double feature time. Issue six and seven. Yeah. However, we cannot discuss issue six without first bringing up Episode 12.5. In this episode, Chris makes a Ken Penders-esque tribute to his late dog, Patty, who died of, I think, old age around the time of the making of the comic. Once Patty passes away, she reincarnates as a Sonichu character, and Chris brings her to Quickville via a portal in his closet. On the surface, this may feel like a sweet little tribute to his dog, but as we go deeper into the series, we finna find that this is less of an innocent, misguided gesture, and more of an unhealthy and easily exploitable coping mechanism that Chris uses to deal with loss. And trust me, when certain trolls start getting involved, when they smell that blood, they go ham, bruh. It gets really bad. Episode 14, Evil is Afoot. After Crystal is trapped in the dark mirror hole, Patty Chan and Darkbind Sonichu pull up, and with the help of Meg Chan, start wrecking Mary Lee Walsh, forcing her and the jerk ops to retreat. We then cut to Christian's mayoral office, which happens to be located inside the Quickville Mall, but hey, that's the city's budget for you. Everyone's gathered around the table discussing how to free Crystal out of her seal. Well, most of them are. Others are quite literally just fucking around, talking about bullshit. Chris then yells, SHUT THE FUCK UP! Magichan, being the only one who knows anything about anything around here, announces that the only way they can save Crystal is if they gather the seven Sonichu balls. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. We are introducing the MacGuffins. They are the rip-offs of the rip-off. Seems like Magichan has one already, and Darkbind has two. Turns out Darkbind has been gathering Sonichu balls this entire time in order to save his gal pal Zelina from the friend zone. Suddenly, they hear an explosion from downstairs. It's Blachu robbing the K-Jewelers, but this time, he's not alone. Accompanying him is a mysterious green Sonichu rocking a cod piece. The green Sonichu has just obtained another Sonichu ball. After being confronted by Chris and the gang, Gimpchu over here bodies Sonichu and Magichan before trapping Chris in the Shadow Realm. It is revealed to be Nate Cirque, who obtained evil Sonichu powers after Chris's medallion was submerged in the energy of the Dark Mirror Hole. Chris responds by roasting his fit. Come on, dudes, get with the program. Nobody wants to see these nips. Cowardly liar! You dare put me down with your insults? Where I lack in confidence, I, I make up for in heart, strength, and the caring love boost from my sweet friend, Meg, Meg Chan. You weakling! 
Your feeble autism is no match for my dark power. Once the Shadow Realm vanishes, the true battle begins. So you know what that means. Sing along with me now. Nonsense paneling and choreography. Wow, guess it's a good thing he wore that cup after all. With the help of the Sonichu Ball, Nate Cirque gains the upper hand and is about to finish Chris off. But before he has the chance, he gets pegged in the head with a basketball and knocked the fuck out. Now, who could have done this? If you're thinking Blachu, well, get cancelled on Twitter, scrub, because it happened to be someone completely different. It was Bionic the Hedgehog, Chris Chan's first OC made in 1999 by cleverly combining Sonic the Hedgehog with Biasketball. According to Chris Tree, Quick here first came up with the character after he was pegged in the head with a basketball while working as the water boy for the school team. Meaning we have one of these motherfuckers to thank for all of this. The last page of the comic features the original drawing of Bionic the Hedgehog from back in 1999. I fought my autism and won. If if only, Chris. If only. The issue also features an ad for Christian and the Hedgehog Boy's debut album, an actual album Chris made and I reviewed. So check that out if you're interested. Time for issue 7. Let's go. Episode 15. Time for a ball. Remember that guy? Turns out that guy is really that girl and has been dating Bionic, my bad. Magichan and Sonichu catch up, and Magichan realizes that the Sonichu ball is in fact in the high school gymnasium where Chris used to be a student. However, it is back in time. Turns out Chris wasn't hit in the head with a basketball, it was in fact a Sonichu ball. And then Chris pulls a Family Guy cutaway gag. Now, if a Family Guy cutaway gag isn't the sign of a well-made piece of media, be it a comic, movie, TV show, etc. You know, it's it, it's a guaranteed W, you know? You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, Lois, remember the time I became Chris Chan? Chris, Sonichu, and Magichan discuss the plan. Well, Sonichu and Magichan discuss the plan. Chris goes on a tangent about how much he's attracted to Megan from Family Guy? Megan, bruh? Really? Megan. Megatron Griffin. Hey, bro, you do you. Whatever. During episode 16, Time Hogs, they go back in time and we see Chris at 14 years old. All right, another day of managing the basic basketball team at freshman, freshman year. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, you, you managed the basketball team. You weren't just a water boy. You managed it. You were the manager of the Lancers, okay. You played that bench so well, the school district was like, hey yo, give this kid a management position. <laughs> Things go smooth enough, Sonichu snags the ball, replaces it with a basketball, and they dip. But uh oh, Chris got stuck in the time void. Sonichu breaks the news to Rosichu and she's very broken up about it. But no time for that because anime fan service. Meanwhile, at the private villa of corrupted citizens, all of the villains have gathered, including some new ones like Jason from Encyclopedia Dramatica and his sex his sex slave, Chris. This is TVY7. I'm not just saying that because there's Sonic characters in here. You dead ass wrote in this issue that it was TVY7. Last I checked. Sex slaves on TV Y7. But yeah, now that Chris is out of the picture, they plan to take over Quickville, you know, with with their age-appropriate sex slaves. We then see Chris traveling through the void. Chris has a mental breakdown due to all the shit happening to him in real life as he's making the comic. Notice how he claims Sailor Megtoon broke up with him, despite them never really being a thing in the first place? Well, this is because a website called Encyclopedia Dramatica, remember that from a couple sentences ago? Made an article mocking him. As a response, Chris thought it would be a good idea to edit the page to show just how much cartoon pussy he get. One of the pictures consisted of him finger-banging Megan. Once Megan caught wind of this, she was understandably fucking livid. Chris tried to explain his actions via email, but that went about as well as a white bumpkin doing a lyrically accurate country cover of Marvin's Room by Drake, i.e. not at fucking all. And with that ends Sonichu issue 7. Oh. Oh man. I'm so pumped. I'm so pumped. Sonichu issue 8 is next. And that is the tipping point, bruh. That is the tipping point. That is the moment. 
that is when Sonichu officially goes off the deep end and I'm I'm hyped bro I'm literally bouncing in my chair out of excitement this is the point of no return so please for your benefit like comment and subscribe hit the bell so you can be notified when my issue 8 video coming out sweet nectar welcome to club doom where it's time been putting it off long enough i made a promise no matter what happens we doing it doesn't matter if i have to pull an only fans we finna start the year off with sonichu issue 8 are you scared you should be scared you should be terrified Ever want to learn about the reproductive anatomy of a Sonichu, huh? Do ya? Cause Chris wants you to learn, so you don't get any funny ideas of drawing Rosichu with a pickle and putting it on Encyclopedia Dramatica. Chris wants you to know that a Rosichu's china is normally hidden from view by some flap of skin which only recedes during urination, arousal, or a psychic attack. Rosichu's nips appear only when aroused for sensual massage, which means a Rosichu can only nurse their young when horny. Rosichu possesses a V-shaped pouch behind the opening, which apparently serves the same function as a human uterus. Sonichu's thang resides entirely within its abdominal cavity, while the testicles are permanently contained behind a bone-like structure for protection. The the wang can emerge for urination or intercourse when the Sonichu leans forward, causing the erect member to slide out purely by gravitational force. This presumably means that Sonichu must be erect to urinate. <laughs> oh my god! That's so nasty! Why would you ever do this? Not only that, but we also learned that Sonichu is the president of the 8-inch club and requires double extra length condoms so that they don't burst during intercourse. And then we are provided with a demonstration in all of its hot, deformed, fridge-drawing glory. Oh, oh, he looks so bad! Later, Sonichu seeks out even more putrid beast sex from his sow, but Rosichu is a little too preoccupied with a website called 4centgarbage.com, which is an obvious parody of Encyclopedia Dramatica and 4chan, two websites Chris had beef with. She's upset because the website mocks them and their father, Chris Chan. Upon inspection, Sonichu is mortified when he sees that people have been drawing pornographic images of his girlfriend with a penis and vomits as a result. You know what? Fair. If I found a website where people were drawing weird porn of my girlfriend, I'd freak the fuck out too. But this Chris Chan we talking about, so you know for a fact it ain't because Chris believes drawing porn of real people is creepy as fuck. Sonichu and Rosichu decide the best way to deal with this is to have Rosichu make an OnlyFans. Only two problems. One, it's a decade before the website's inception. Two, they're feeding the trolls. Rosichu uploads the lewd photos of herself, and as a response, the good folk over at 4centgarbage.com make even more pickle pornography of her. What a shock to the extreme! Later, Wild Sonichu and Magichan decide they're going to take time out of their busy schedules to help Sonichu and Rosichu beef with a random website based in Tennessee. Sonichu and Rosichu go in through the front, and they let Wild hit it from the back so we can sneak in and take a Sonichu ball, which I guess is just in the building for arbitrary plot convenience. Our love hogs take the elevator, assault some employees, and look at a montage of weird pictures from Encyclopedia Dramatica until they finally confront Jason, the guy who made the ED page about Chris in the first place. Listen, mister, we don't mean any trouble, but the things you and your employees said about us in your article were really hurtful, and the images of my girlfriend Rosie here were way too far, and we would very much appreciate it if maybe you could just find it in your heart to take down the page and just leave us alone. Fuck you. And then Jason just bodies Sonichu, my goddamn. Sonichu and Rosichu are about to leave. That is, 
until Jason throws a pickle at Rosachu. Big mistake, buddy, because Rosachu goes total bitch mode on this guy. She rips off all of her clothes, shoves her china in his face, and then proceeds to tear and claw at the back of his skull. The incredible lioness! What the f- what the fuck am I looking at? They then leave Jason barely alive in a pool of pussy juice and his own blood before going outside and meeting Wild, whom I guess got the Sonichu ball, hooray. Analysis, what the hell did I just read? I'll tell you what I read, the signs. People like to speculate, oh, if Chris never discovered the internet, they would never be in their current situation, ha 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 ha! Bullshit. There are signs all throughout Christory, between the Megan situation to the botched Sonic boom protest that exemplify why Chris Chris and their shithead family should have never been allowed in the public to begin with. I mean, when all it takes for you to rename your kid is an animatronic bear fucking up the pronunciation of his name because you think it's a sign from God, then it's evident that all three of you are basket cases, and that the jail saga was inevitable. Issue 8 here is just another example, and I highly recommend anyone read this particular issue if you ever want to get a sense of just how much of a raving lunatic Chris is, especially in the epilogue where a 14-year-old girl named Sabine Hina tries to help Rose and the other Sonichus with their porno photo shoot, and then Rosachu declines due to the dumb laws. Yeah, uh-huh. I think you see why they in jail now. Episode 18, it's Rosachu's birthday! Oh wait, no, it's the Chaotic Combo's anniversary! Oh wait, no, it's Sonichu's 20th birthday! What is going on? Oh wait, no, it's Blake's birthday! Finally, Chris gives him a name that doesn't sound like a racial slur. Turns out he and Bubbles Rosachu are secretly dating, so we gotta be quiet. In fact, later while they're at the beach, they like to come up with excuses to be alone together. For example, Blake will kick sand in the other Rosachu's faces, and then Bubbles will step in to punish him. Matter of fact, this panel looked like she'd be pegging him. All right, big man, I'm gonna show you the real power of a woman. It's not as gentle as you think it is. So anyway, they make plans to play another round of Peggy Hill over under Pier 960 Noise. Enter Silvana Rosachu, a Rosachu born from the chaotic rainbow that somehow got launched to the moon and is now a minion of Count Graduon. Her ingenious plan? To disguise herself as Bubbles and trick Blake into having sex with her. Why? I don't know. Well, really, it's to put them in a sleeping spell. I guess if the plan can include sex, you might as well. Enjoy my sleep nectar. Club Doom crossover, baby. This is my quick villo C. His name is Kinks. He's a crossover between Klonoa and Blinks. He got the same ability as Wonder of You from JoJo's Part 8, and his favorite genre of music is Moancore. <laughs> Silvana then disguises herself as Blake so she can lure Bubbles into the same trap. I guess the plan just be to catfish every Sonichu you see. I mean, makes sense. You know how many times it worked against their creator? I'll tell you how much. I'll tell you exactly how much. A lot. Magichan attempts to warn Bubbles using telekinesis. Bubbles retorts, but sex. But sex? Exactly. That is, until one of Bubbles' friends lets her know that she found Blake unconscious in a closet somewhere. Bubbles tells Magichan to teleport her over to Blake so she can comfort him. Blake then misgenders Silvana. Oh no, guess we have to flood his comment section with hate comments. And then we get an update on what's been going on with Chris since he got locked up in the time void. None of which relates to being in a time void, it's all just personal life shit. Chris briefly discusses the three women he had been involved with during the fall of 2008, all of which were trolls catfishing him, go figure. Seems like he had a hard time picking between the three of them, but God made the decision for him when one was assassinated by Optimus Prime, yeah, no, really, that's something he puts in the comic, and the other was in allegiance with the trolls, meaning Panda Halo is declared as Chris's true sweetheart, and the one person he would promise his first time to, although he would abandon her for dead within two months. Also, we get a little teaser for the Clyde Cash saga, but that honestly a topic for another video. Now, if you excuse me, Chris just dropped their Ten Commandments during my recording session, so I gotta get on that. Sleep Nectar. Welcome to Club Doom, where we're going back to college, baby! We finna get our masters in dating education at Quickville University. Yes, this is in fact the issue where Chris pitches his dating education class idea. The idea of the class is simple. Each student gets paired with one another to go on practice dates, with the eventual goal being to form a relationship with said partner. Meaning, if there happened to be a high-functioning autistic man-child who just couldn't seem to find a boyfriend-free girl, he wouldn't get left out. Go figure. So let's see how exactly this concept falls on its face. Also, I'ma just keep a little handy dandy dead sweetheart counter in the corner. Just 
just in case we need it. You, you never know. You never know. Episode 19, Dated or Date Ed. Some fuckboy in Date Ed named Reginald is salty because Punchy Sonichu got paired with Layla, the girl he had a crush on. So Reginald goes around trying to sabotage Punchy's grade by any means necessary. Love how in the same story Chris be using to promote this idea, he exemplifying what exactly could go wrong if it were ever adopted by the education system. Another classmate named Ivy decides she's not going to participate in this stupid, stupid idea for a class. Not because it's downright brain dead, but because she had a shared dream with Chris, where God and Jesus declared them to be destined lovers forever, showing that even God got his own troll op. Ms. Jackarass, or Sarah Jackson, wink wink, instructs the students on how to perform the ever-elusive DM slide. Reginald tries to cuck Punchy by committing property damage against the school, but Punchy uses his Chad-like instincts to go ask Wilde to go ask Layla on his behalf, securing the date. Now I want you to imagine you're in Layla's position. You take the dumbest sounding extracurricular class known to mankind because, I don't know, you need enough credits to get written out of this god-awful webcomic. You reluctantly let some dork who couldn't even be bothered to ask you out himself take you on a date. You dread the moment he shows up to your house. But then, he pulls up to your place on a motorcycle. He takes you for a ride on the wide open road, handling the bike with ease. He's calm, cool, collected. The only thing louder than the wind blowing against your helmet is the sound of Steppenwolf riffs on electric guitar. You start thinking to yourself, maybe this guy ain't so bad. Maybe you misjudged him. Maybe you two just might actually have a future together. And then he takes your ass to McDonald's. No, not on the way to the date. This is the date. You are at McDonald's. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Have fun watching him struggle in the ball pit. That's a deal breaker. We find Reginald on a park bench sulking because, I don't know, Chris Chan's court hearing got another continuance or something. Then Angelica Rosichu just shows up out of bloody nowhere and she asks him to dinner. Yeah, Chris, don't we all wish it were that easy? I don't even know if they've ever interacted before. And then the episode ends with everyone at the park during their respective dates. And I guess Wild got laid too. I like how Wild has just become the background plot device guy. Anytime Chris needs something done in the background, the job immediately goes to Wild. Oh, and I guess Miss Jackarass, Sarah Jackson, got killed in a vehicular accident involving Optimus Prime. And I guess the corrupt Quickville school district simply forced her grieving sister to substitute for, you know, instead of giving her time to mourn. Okay. Everyone passes dating Ed with the exception of Clyde Cash, but that's a topic for another video. Original version Yes, you heard that right. There's actually cut content from this episode, which is crazy. Chris never cuts anything from his content, no matter how incriminating it might be. If the health department of Green County sees those videos that you put on the damn internet, they could condemn our house and we would have to move out of it. But according to Ivy, the character slash catfish troll, Chris originally planned to make this episode much raunchier than usual. Specifically, there was a scene where Punchy was supposed to bone Layla in the ladies' room at McDonald's, specifically the handicap stall, and Reginald was supposed to walk in on it. Reginald was going to slash Punchy's tires in a fit of rage and jealousy. Bruh! The bathroom scenario was apparently based on a fantasy Chris kept bringing up in conversation with Ivy! Yo, jail was inevitable, bruh. It really took y'all 10 years to find out Chris be going to jail at some point in his life. Now, before we move on with episode 20, I want to point out that Chris made a final exam for dating Ed, and in the comic, he invites us to take it. So I sent this to my one co-host, Cheddar Cheese. You may recognize him from the Sonichu Issue Zero video, as well as some reaction vids we did back in the day. So let's see how he does. Let's see, number one, uh, he got wrong. Number two, wrong. N number three, oh, he got that one right. Um, four, wrong. <laughs> this ain't looking good. All right, let's see how he does on the essay question. It wants you to list a 10-step approach to talking to a girl. I bet. So how does Cheddar respond? Number one, catch live catfish. Number two, Strut up to women and hold in catfish. Number three, strut your stoof to relay shoe off prime breakable jeans. 
to pass the chillins with a dollar sign. Number four, Holu Catfish Tuo Women. Number five, you like my fish? His name's Jerome. Number six, smile to women. Should be in awe of your massive fish. Number seven, hey, since this impressed you, want to stop benign boyfriendless and date me? Number eight, women should be swooned. Throw catfish over your shoulder, all sexy like uwu. Number nine, take women hammed with hand, not holding catfish. Number ten, schlong catfish over her shoulder. Over her shoulder? <laughs> Walk off intro sunset. Guys, I don't think Chet is getting laid. <laughs> Episode 20. Quick defense. With Chris Chan gone and their jerk-off army restored, the private villa of corrupted citizens orchestrates an attack on the sovereign city-state of Quickville. Meanwhile, Billy Mays informs us that he's not the mayor of Quickville. Good to know. Thanks, buddy. But yeah, anyway, Nate Sirk, Wesley, and Savannah are scouting for vantage points around the city for the impending invasion. None of the Sonichu are around to stop them because they all too busy fucking in the apartments and trees, even in the church. Like, damn. Well, everyone but Sonichu, he too busy getting mad at Yaoi and breaking his own furniture. Also, Sonichu and Rosichu have kids now, implying significant time has passed since Chris went to jail. I mean, the time void. Rosa Chu be looking like she want to have another, but no time for that because giant robots are attacking the city, as well as an army of unionized jerk ops. A huge Infinity War esque battle commences. All Sonichu are on the front line. Magichan fights Savanna. Blake fights off some Decepticons. Sonichu fights Liquid Chris. Even Chris's shitty car pulls up and turns into a giant robot to clap some butt cheeks. Patty Chan creates a magic barrier to protect them all, but even that is not enough, as the battle-induced earthquakes cause severe damage to the building, killing Ivy while she is trapped in the elevator, Modern Warfare 3 Makarov style. R.I.P. to a real one. The gang holds off the jerk ops as long as they can. Quickville paramedics load defeated jerk ops into ambulances for unbrainwashing. You know, kind of like how Chai does with Muslims. Buildings get destroyed and burnt to the ground amidst the chaos. Not everyone is able to make it out alive. Yeah, we all saw this coming. Panda Halo burns to death too. That's three. So many sweethearts dropping like flies. It's unreal. Rosichu gets kidnapped again and doesn't transform into her like two, three superpowered forms to muck him up. So Sonichu finna have to go and save her ass again. The PVCC gives our hero an ultimatum. Either Nate Sirk is appointed the new ruler of Quickville, or Rosichu dies. Sonichu flat out refuses, cause yeah, while he loves his wife, if Chris Chan were to ever come back and find out someone took over his imaginary power fantasy setting, he is going to be a total bitch about it. Darkbind and Bionic, however, run up on the villains and help rescue Rosichu. Nate Zerk pegs Bionic in the head with a Pokeball as revenge for issue seven, summoning a Nido King that they immediately hit in the- <laughs> I'm so glad I got to use that clip. I love that clip so much. He don't clap that dude's nuts like he's slapping a girl ass. Sonichu yoinks Mary Lee Walsh's broom from her mid-flight, causing her to fall, but Count Graduan creates a Halo Forge grid beneath her so she and Sonichu can duke it out. Unsurprisingly to no one, Mary be catching hands like she Marcus Williams, and Sonichu about to hit her with the Virtual Fighter 3 ring out. Graduan be like, screw this, and dips, letting the witch fall. But Sonichu saves her. She asks him why would he do such a thing, and uh, his answer's quite baffling. You'd think he'd say something like, because it's the right thing to do, but no, it's so that Chris can have the killing blow. These are supposed to be the heroes, mind you. With Walsh defeated and the jerk ops gone, the gang works to rebuild the city. The issue ends with a teaser of Chris returning from the time void ready for action. And there we go, the pen ultimate issue of the first season to Sonichu. I have heard that issue 10 gets quite interesting. So I'ma aim to have that out by Christian Love Day. Also, one last thing before I dip. In one of my previous videos, I invited people to Photoshop this image here, and we actually had a good turnout of entries, so I'ma just end the video with a little montage, and I will catch you at the season finale 
of Sonichu. Sweet nectar. Give it up, give it up, give it up, bossy boss. Give it up, give it up, give it up, bossy boss. Eat my children, eat my children. Oh, no, no, yeah. Give it up, give it up, give it up, bossy boss. Give it up, give it up, give it up, bossy boss. Eat my children, eat my children. Oh, no, no, yeah. Give it up, give it up, give it up, bossy boss. No love, man, me come. Welcome to Club Doom, where Chris Chan made a gay vaccine. Issue 10 of Sonichu starts with Chris being rescued from the Time Void by Magichan and Wild Sonichu. He explains how while in the Time Void, he traveled to the future, collaborated with scientists, and made a cure for homosexuality. Using his quote-unquote pure straight blood, Chris then instructs Magichan to travel through time, collecting vaccines from the future, so they can go back to the past and put it in the water supply. Effectively eradicating homosexuality from the world as well as time and space. Guys, I think someone may have called Chris Chan gay. I have seen dudes go to hilarious lengths to prove they ain't gay, but it's on a whole nother level, bro. This be the first three pages of the comic. There are 98 in total. Uh, yeah, I guess that means viewer discretion is advised. And if you ain't in the best mood today, you ain't feeling like laughing at some pure dumb assitude, you got a thorn in your side, then I suggest you take a nap, drink some tea, do some yoga, maybe go on a run, listen to some jazz, and then come back when you are ready. Cause we finna celebrate Christian Love Day right with Sonichu issue 10, Lego. Now, there'll only be one episode in this issue. Episode 21, Christian Chandler and the Director Amenities. But this one kinda go for the entirety of the book, so instead of chronicling moments in the story by episodes, this time we finna go by beefs. Cause Chris Chan looking to settle a lot of different beefs in this issue. Chris in the comic be like the baby in real life he throwing hands with practically everybody get ready for the next battle Jason Howe uses Christian's irrational hatred of Xbox to lure him into a trap. Trapped in a cage, the devil pulls up and steals his Sonichu medallion. But haha, -ha, the Sonichu medallion was not really the true source of Chris Chan's power. It was in fact his class ring from high school that gave him super Sonichu powers. Now you probably wonder into yourself why the sudden change in Sonichu's power system. <laughs> Yeah, the medallion Chris wore in real life kind of broke. To this day, Chris believes the trolls intercepted it, as it was mailed to a potential sweetheart. Spoiler warning, it was a catfish. So anyway, Chris throws a key blast at the devil, but the devil teleports out the way, and the rogue energy blast hits the guy from BBC's Match of the Day instead. Chris deadass thought he was making bootleg Sonichu merch and getting hella guap for it. Some trolls even made their own Jimmy Hill Sonichu. <laughs> That's fucking funny. Get ready for the next battle. Nate Zerk attempts to jump Chris at the park with a wooden plank, but Chris been ready to throw hands like Rayman. They shoot the fade for a page or two with a significant spike in quality. Nate Zerk about to get the drop on him, that is, until Chris injects him with the vaccine, ridding him of the big gay. Now with that evil homo gun, Chris focuses his sight on his next target. Get ready for the next battle. Alright, so here's the plan to get rid of 4 cent garbage. They pull up in a U-Haul and just throw a big concert in front of the building. And who to perform other than Cardi and the Hedgehog- I mean Christian and the Hedgehog Boys. They play a song about the Power Rangers to the tune of Cat Scratch Fever at a whopping 235 decibels. Would definitely explain some hearing problems Chris has. This causes the 4 cent garbage building to collapse. Inside, Jason Howell, Satan, and two other trolls of no significance that totally aren't getting their own videos in the future. Panic as the walls crumble around them. Jason just kind of dips like an asshole, leaving the others to their fate. What do we do now? Uh, you two can eat shit and die. I'ma go hit up Denny's. So, basically the same thing? Hey, don't talk shit about Denny. The two trolls of no significance, wink wink, hold hands before leaping down the 72-story elevator shaft together as the building falls around them. And also they make out. Get ready for the next battle. 
After obtaining the seven Sonichu balls, Chris turns into Colossal Chris Chan. I wish he just stuck with the old design, that thing fugly. With his newfound power, he is ready to take on Mary Lee Walsh, despite having whooped her ass multiple times before. She gives her tragic backstory, how she turned to witchcraft because no one could love her. And if she couldn't find love, then no one, especially Chris Chan, could find love. She hands over the wand Count Graduan is sealed in so she can fight him with honor and Chris smashes Graduan into pieces. After some dual spirit sword on pitchfork action, Chris manages to paralyze Walsh from the deck down and she concedes. All this cause she wouldn't let him put up his virgin ads on the college campus. Get ready for the next battle. Right, so there was this guy named Alec who was making a parody comic of Sonichu called Asperchu. Naturally, this got Chris tilted, so obviously he finna make Alec a villain here. Chris breaks into the dude's home and proceeds to delete all of his ROMs. Oh no! Not the ooze on Sega Genesis. Not my fan translation of Mother 3. Anything but the PAL version of Gregory Horror Show for PlayStation 2. Have mercy. No, no, don't- I, Actually, I don't even know why I got Knuckles Chaotix on there. You could just delete that. Sonichu looks outside to find the cast of Asperchu just chilling. They drawn intentionally worse than normal, which is- Fucking hilarious. Sonichu then uses his ultra form brought on by the Sonichu balls to cure them of being gay-tarded. Please do not strike me, YouTube. This is what actually happens in the comic. I am sorry. Now, as Chris coming out, the cast of Asperchu literally bow down before him like a god. Epic foreshadowing. Naturally, Alec is pissed. And like Danny Lay's brother at a bowling alley thinks he finna walk up by himself and start some ish without getting jumped by like 12 people. Later, Chris be given a speech about how he defeated Mary Lee Walsh and saved the day from homosexuality and also it's banned. We cut to Wild Sonichu, who honestly has grown to become my favorite in the cast. I remember back when I introduced him in issue 3, I thought he was just some green jackass who probably wouldn't do anything. Boy, was I wrong. This whole time, he just kind of been in the background, lending a hand whenever any of his friends need him. He just been an absolute Chad. And now he got a wife and a kid on the way. Things are looking on the up and up. I'm so glad that my favorite character is going something bad finna happen. <laughs> Time? Wild Sonichu's wife gets killed in a terrorist bombing. Damn it, first the ending to Ozark Season 4 Part 1, now this. I can't have anything. Wild's egg hatches. It's a girl and she looks exactly like her mother. Wild then raises her to become an angry, violent, vengeful psychopath. Damn, bro, I really did not expect my favorite character to have an arc like that. What a fall from grace. It would be kind of cool if the rest of the comic wasn't total dog doo-doo. Anyway, the Asperpedia four, i.e. Alec and his posse, are held responsible and sent to trial for murder and slander, but mostly slander. So how does the trial go? Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll show you how it goes. After that brutal execution scene, Chris then gives another speech that rips off Independence Day in honor of February 24th, the precise day the aforementioned gay vaccine eradicated all of homosexuality, which happens to be Chris's birthday, proving once and for all Chris can't be gay because it doesn't exist. And so they declare it a holiday to celebrate straight love. Mankind. That word should have new meaning for all of us here today. We can't be consumed by our petty differences anymore. We will be united in our common interests. Perhaps it is fate 
that today is Mexico's Flag Day. And we will once again be saluting an image of freedom. Not just from trolling, loneliness, or persecution, but from heartbreak. We are fighting for our right to love, to be honest. And when the sun sets today, the 24th of February will no longer be known as only a Mexican holiday, but as the day Sonichu fans and I declared in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. We're going to survive. And today, we celebrate our Christian Love Day. What the foot? Yeah, this thing is a mess. The, this whole book is a mess. This whole series is a mess. It is a hot mess. And I love every second of it. I hope y'all enjoyed season one of Sonichu as much as I did. Hopefully season two will have just as many lols. And then there's probably never going to be a season three. Because Chris is in jail. And instead of drawing Sonichu comics, they are just writing letters about how they Jesus. I will say, I did like the beefs format. Kind of gives me an idea for a series. I think I'm going to go over all the different beefs Chris had over the years. That would be fun. So like, comment, and subscribe for that. And I will catch you guys later. After I have some time to process what I just read. Sweet nectar. Welcome to Club Doom, where it's been a hot minute, ain't it? Not just for the coverage of Sonichu, but for the comic itself. You see, after Sonichu issue 10, Chris kinda took a bit of a break from making comics in pursuit of other things. And if you think Berserk and Hunter Hunter hiatuses are long, <laughs> then you'll love this. Eight years! There was a six to eight year gap between the release of Sonichu issue 10 and Sonichu issue 11. So was it worth the wait? would be a very stupid question indeed, because obviously no. Honestly, this one kind of a slog to get through. It's longer than issue 10, but it ain't got the same grandiose feel. In fact, everything including the stupid factor seems toned down, which be a shame because that was the only thing the series got going for it. And it all just kind of lack in this time. Ah, oh, well, I heard issue 13's a trip, but until then, we're just kind of stuck with this. A Sonichu Christmas. Probably the most boring episode in the entire series. Sarah Sonny, Rosa Chu's daughter, made all her friends cookies, except for the Jew. He gets a single cookie, shaped like a candle. Cause that's a Jewish thing, right? Just like how one bakes they black friends pick comb shaped cookies for Kwanzaa. Christine Rosa Chu, no not that Christine Rosa Chu, this Christine Rosa Chu, is practicing for her school play. Mommy, Daddy, you wanna see me do my part for the school play? Oh, would you look at the time? I gotta do a thing that isn't here, Bob. Sarah got a play date over at the aforementioned Jewish friend's house. His name is Kevin, and she proceeds to Shrek his ass in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Kevin's being a salty shit, so Sarah tries consoling him by giving him the candle cookie. But Kevin geeks out because he's afraid of the flame on the candle because he was in an explosion? What? When the fuck did this happen? Are we talking about the game? Are we talking about the game of COD, or is this its own... Isolated incident. I, I don't fucking know. But yeah, Sarah dips as the vibe has officially been killed. She sulks on her bed, feeling bad that there are so many fedora wearing scrub lords in the world. Sonichu and Robbie Sonny go shopping and help a homeless woman. Uh, there's, there's not really much going on here. I don't know what this is about. Blake gets butt hurt that people keep thinking he's black when he really has the heartbreak of reventiligo. That's a skin condition that's the opposite of what Michael Jackson's got. Yeah, honestly, a big chunk of this episode is just. Sonichu's talking while rocking that Bob Chandler drip. But eventually at the play, they do in their little reenactment of Jesus' birth when Christine, no, not that one, that one, starts evolving into a full-grown Rosichu in the middle of the play. Oh, would you look at the time? I gotta do a thing that isn't here. I'ma head out. Bye. Sonichu is such a good dad. So yeah, Christine, no, not that one, that one, runs and hides. She's eventually consoled by her mother, and they sing Britney Spears on opposite sides of the door. Sonichu does, in fact, come back with new clothes for Christine, no, not that one, that one, to wear, and the 
play continues as normal, and everybody just kinda accepts the fact that Mary grew like four feet after birthing Jesus. It's a Christmas miracle. And then Kevin dumps Sarah, because apparently they were dating. It's okay, Sarah. He was a hard scoping pleb anyway. You deserve better. The Christmas party arrives at the Quickville Mall, and Rosichu explains to everyone that Christine, no, not the no, not that one, that one won. I totally nailed that on the first take. Shut up. Couldn't make it to the party, because she with family or some shit. So they decide to hit up the Chandler household. Blake hits on Chris. I want to say ew, but I feel like I'd get canceled. Ah, forget it. Woman or not, there's probably Cheeto dust under them titties. And they take a big group photo. Ain't that sweet. We then get something for the S L G B T Q. The S stands for straight. Ah, yes, because wanting to exclude the straights was totally the reason why the L G B T Q was created. It wasn't like gay people back in the day were getting lynched or anything. Okay, Chris. Okay, so remember Wild Sonichu's wife Simona and how she was a ripoff of a fan drawing? Well, now Chris just dead ass snatched the fan character for themselves. Enter Simon, Simona's brother, the man responsible for the terrorist bombing that almost killed his sister. Yeah, she's alive now. Chris retconned that. The Asperpedia 4 were also exiled to the Amish country instead of being brutally executed. Roll with it. So what political motive drove Simon to commit such treason and harm his own cyst brainwashing? It was brainwashing. He was brainwashed by the Asperpedia 4. Remember, this comic by the same person who thought openly admitting to banging they mom was a flex. Don't expect anything too deep or metaphorical here. But yeah, Simon gets a text from his sister telling him that she forgives him. He pulls up to her house and is immediately greeted by Wild and Sandy wanting to throw hands. You'd think there'd be a family meeting about what would happen if Uncle Simon were to at some point visit or something after Simona's recovery. But you know, uh, hitting the G spot better than Bob ever did was a uh, was a quote was a quotable from a certain call. So uh, I take it family meetings weren't particularly a concept in uh, the Chandler household. So that might be a foreign idea to the Sonichu family structure. They have dinner and Simon explains how he was kidnapped and tortured by the Asperpedia 4 to be their slave, subjected to all kinds of mind-breaking experiments like forced evolution and being forced to watch Club Doom videos. <sighs> Simon gives Wild a claw fossil thing and Wild gives it to Angie, and Angie gives it to Reginald. It's just a good old game of hot potato here. Guess no one really wants that thing. It's like that one really lame Christmas present at the family gathering that people just kind of like pass to each other throughout the years because nobody fucking want it. Like an antique train collection or fucking Battlefront 2 on Xbox One. But yeah, this claw fossil thing causes Reginald to evolve and tear up the bedroom. No, uh, not, not in the typical Chris Chan drawing porn kind of way, in like the oh he actually had a mental breakdown and destroyed Angelica Sonichu's bedroom in a fit of rage kind of way. Good on you, Chris. Good on you for resisting the overwhelming temptation. I'm sure it was difficult. Reginald runs away because he feels he is a threat to Angie. And now I have to talk about... <sighs> Banana motherfucking, motherfucking goddamn, goddamn sons, sons of bitchin', bitchin fuck fuck fucking Saurus. So some really funny clever motherfucker, yeah, wrote and designed this character as well as paid Chris like a hundred dollars to put him in Sonichu 11 as a joke, I guess. But, uh, one thing. This has to be the lamest fucking joke on the planet. Some real damn, bro. You got the whole squad laughing like shit. So Simon and Sandy be bonding, going to the museum and shit, because Simon found another fucking fossil thing while dumpster diving or some shit. Can you tell I'm enjoying this issue? And the thing evolves into a Bananasaurus. Oh, you know, like, it's some kind of weird Pokemon thing. No one can understand what the fuck he's saying except for Punchy. Bananasaurus gives his tragic backstory where he got hit by a Camaro while listening to ACDC. I mean, makes sense. It was the Mesozoic era. Yeah. That's right, dad. I took it there. With your fucking dad cars and your fucking dad rock. What you gonna do about it, you old bitch? So anyway, Punchy invites Bananasaurus to crash at his place, much to the dismay of Punchy's girlfriend, Layla. You know, they're, they're roommates now, guys. It's it's so funny. Punchy and Bananasaurus are funny, hilarious roommates. It's so fucking funny. I want to die. And while they're walking, we get another text stump about Bananasaurus, uh, and he, he was once a human named David, and he was in high school, and had a GPA of- This is dumb! 
This is like frustratingly stupid, even for Sonichu standards. Who is the douche canoe who genuinely thought this was a funny idea? I want to smack the shit out of him for making me read this bullshit. We won't even make it to the ring, my guy. But yeah, anyway, David gets fucked by a ditto and Layla leaves punchy, but not before clocking David in the face. Nice. And then Chris summarizes the rest because time is short for this episode. Like, Chris, it's been like six years. When the fuck is the deadline? But yeah, Layla and Reginald are dating now. Cool. All right, home stretch. What do we got now? It's a clip show. Yeah, that's so good. <laughs> <laughs> issue 11 becoming a pain in the ass, no cap. This has got to be like my least fucking favorite issue so far. Please tell me it doesn't get worse than this. Oh, and these clip shows are season two's equivalent to sub episodes? God. Damn! Like, Chris, you are slowly killing me of boredom here. Like, it your ultimate attack like shit. Alright, so it looked like the goal here is to catch the reader up in what's been going on in Sonichu lore since, you know, Chris stopped making comics after issue 10. So, Sonichu has an interview with Silvana, who's morphed into Sonic for no fucking reason. And they just kind of sit at the ball and talk about shit. Like, like, look at this. Look at this. Look at all this text. There's like 10 pages of this bullshit. I don't want to fucking read it. I don't, like, who the fuck cares what a Sonichite is? Basically, it's just a Sonichu Mega Evolution Stone. The end. I, like, I don't even think it ever comes back. Like, I think Chris used it in the D&D &D character sheet. And I only know that because Marshall Nerd just recently made a video about that. So, yeah, I'll, I guess I'll just give y'all some of the highlights for these uh, pseudo sub episodes here. All right, so Robbie Sonichu getting bullied at school by Binky over here. Sarah being the MLG 360 no scope and pro who will do anything to protect uh, clan Sarachu uh, steps up against the bully. The bully then uses getting a jerk op's attention as an excuse to kiss another boy. Or he uses kissing another boy as an excuse to get a jerk op's attention. I don't know, it's Chris. It could be either or, honestly. And then they beat up the jerk op and Sarah evolves. I Hey, awesome. The Sonichite thing happens. Sonichu and Rosichu evolve into their super forms for like two minutes. Uh, what else? Chris turns into a woman after beating up Mary Lee Walsh. I, I guess, I guess he absorbed her womanhood and became Christine Chandler. <laughs> not, not really. That's not really how it happens. But like, this is, this, 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 this episode is just rough. Like, reading it was rough. Reading the summary on the quickie was also rough. It's just a whole lot of nothing like chris chimes into the interview and we get some updates about how robbie sonichu is now roberta rosichu uh you know but it's all kind of just buried under great walls of text and then bob chandler hits up our great omnipotent sonichu overlord to remind her to pick up some tv dinners on the way home from walmart bet and that is sonichu issue 11 god Fuck this issue. It's like the Twitter text dumps before Chris was on Twitter. Just so much nothing going on. It is so- Like, this one truly and honestly pissed me off reading. Like, at least the earlier ones I could, like, laugh at some things, but here it's just- Ugh. You know what it is? It's the length. I'm looking at issue zero right now. That one was like 40 some pages. This is like one page more than issue 10 was. But without any of the grandiose, hilarious shit that happened in issue 10. So uh, it, 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 it kind of drag a little bit. It just drags just a little bit. A little bit. Would you say it drags, Cheddar? Drags. It drags. It drags a lot. It drags... A lot. So, uh, hopefully the later issues aren't this bad. This is, this is Club Doom. Hoping that, praying for that, and I will catch y'all in the next video. <laughs> Sweet Nectar. Welcome to Club Doom, where... <laughs> Let's keep it 100. We just want to get to issue 13 already, don't we? I mean... That's the big fat stinker from the idea, guys, that was so fucking bad it even broke Chris Chan. And it probably the most relevant to what's going on now. Only thing in our way be chronology. And the fact that these next two issues are Yawn City. Like, bruh, they are boring. No cap, they are boring. 
boring as hell. So let's knock out these SOBs as fast as virtually possible. And I believe I may have found a way of doing that by binging old zero punctuation videos. So we finna take a page out of Yahtzee Crawshaw's Wolfenstein 09 vid and review issues 12 and 12.9 in limerick form. And with any luck, we can knock this out within the week, so let go. There was once a Sawney named Robbie, who took up cross-dressing as a hobby. He can't relate to the bros, cause he could never hold his own in any Modern Warfare 2 lobby. So the school bully was being rude, when there was a kinda abrupt change of mood. He admitted he was gay, yet what gave it away, that one time you kissed another dude? Rob decides he's trans now, shrug, and then evolves from a sisterly hug. It'd be kinda heartwarming, except without any warning, the nasty rat came on the rug. Roberto went to Magichan for hire, whom gave her a mixtape, said it was fire. Robbie slapped that bitch in, heard some bars that were cringe, and then grew chesticles as she desired. You're probably wondering what the point in all this, but you gotta remember, the writer be Chris. It just wish fulfillment, except this time I'm tilted, cause season two been a boatload of piss. Roberta then dates a Trolls OC, but I don't care, cause as you'll soon come to see, well to put it rather blunt, the new trolls are just cunts and they ain't the least bit funny. Now the story be from Christine's view, and ain't Zerk got a bone to pick with you, but now Chris wears a bra and it makes my skin crawl, how she made kids with her own semen, ew. Nate Zerk had done planned this attack, with jerk ops who all got his back, including Quick's bro Cole, who Chris deems has no soul cause she can't leech off him like her household of hacks. Chris wins to no one's surprise, and then a clip show once again greets our eyes, but the shit had me snoring cause it's all rather boring except Rosa Chew's blood pressure rise. Let us skip to the next issue, huh? Cause season 2 sucking out all the fun. I don't care about this shit, damn it, or any stupid wedding rabbit, fucking Gibby always doing too much. This one's about MLP shit, now I'm feeling a sense of regret, but hey, now we're on the verge of the Dimensional merge, cause C197's mentioned. Enter Chris's new alt for the day, Nightstar, another Mary Sue, yay. Good luck keeping track, she got clones out the ass, this roster looking like MK. So new Chris, new setting, cool, but shit ain't happening, don't be fooled, it's a whole lot of nothing, Nightstar transforms or something and goes to Canterlot's special needs school. There is then a sudden shift in direction, as the idea guys plot their interception. Chris be flirting with guys and throwing hands with Ray Rice as they begin to warp Chandler's perception. I could talk about Squawker or Petrie, but we just want to get to issue 13, so I'ma end this shit sooner so we can laugh at the losers who are into Neptunia RP. So next time we finna talk about the vectors that made Chris's already poor mental health fester. If you enjoyed this, please like, maybe comment and subscribe, and I'll catch you all later, sweet Necta. Welcome to Club Doom, where we finally hit the big 1-3, supposedly the stinker of all stinkers, meant to put issues 8 and 10 to shame with the absolute buffoonery that lies beneath this blank, dead front page, and almost like a headstone, in memory of our brain cells. At this point in Christory, one Joshua Wise and his idea guys, named after that one studio that makes lolly pedo bait JRPGs, be using, I guess, Twitter roleplay accounts to convince Chris that video games, cartoons, and other types of fictional media including Sonichu are real, and exist in another dimension, C-197. They then proceed to make Chris retcon key story elements of Sonichu and do all kinds of embarrassing and harmful things on camera and off camera. They also extorted 6k out of Chris by forcing her to buy them video games and gaming merchandise in exchange for the safety of Chris's fantasy world quick fit. This took a mental toll on Chris and warped their already thin perception of reality. Eventually, Noel and his Super Sentai Kiwi writers were able to swoop in and save Chris from these extortionists through the power of docs. Issue 13 is the final result of all this nonsense, and with Joshua's influence is regarded as the breaking point of Sonic. We in the big boy leagues now, people. Either go home or get ready to hear some bullshittery beyond mortal and even godly comprehension. Let go. Destined prophecy. This is our story. I hope not. I would not want my name attached to this thing unless I am ridiculing it. So Joshua in this goes under the name of John Yamada and dresses like he from Stalker. He and Magichan discover that Chris's Sega Dreamcast apparently a dimensional portal which allows people to jump between worlds. I guess when you finally discover a control scheme for Quake 3 that's actually playable without having to resort to buying a keyboard and mouse, a time-space rift just kind of opens in your living room. It transports them to Game Industry from Hyperdimension Neptune 
Junia. Chris shares a body with one of the characters, Uzume, apparently her evil half, Karomi, Monica from Doki Doki Literature Club, and a con off a of hardcore Henry just be casually going around being dicks, giving nerds wedgies and purple nurples like shit. And I guess they shoved Neptune herself in an interdimensional locker or something. All this while supplying Count Graduon the necessary resources to attempt a full-scale invasion of Quickville. With the help of Christine, Uzume is able to fuse back with Karomi to become a full-fledged Dreamcast waifu again, complete with no DVD player and no piracy protection to stop you from just burning ISOs of Marvel vs. Capcom 2 on a CDR. Good for her. Meanwhile, Monica ain't looking too good. Looks like she took one too many resets to the head, and she manages to capture Silvana Rosichu, who's trying to rescue Neptune from the aforementioned interdimensional locker. She apparently got the ability to wipe people's memories, but Chris is immune, probably due to the fact that she can't remember jack about shit anyway. Since Graduan got bodied in like two seconds, Akon decides to invade Quickville again while they still trying to recover. He deems himself the new all-powerful ruler of this nation, you know, while sitting around in the management office at the mall. Chris sends a massive fuck-off meteor from space to destroy the building, but Akon ain't no bitch, so he survives and begins squatting at 14 Branch Lane to ride this out. Count Graduan, whom I like to imagine sounds like Makarov off of Modern Warfare, signs a temporary peace treaty with Chris, and together they drive Akon's forces out of Quickville. Akon, being a salty shit, pulls a low-tier god and bans both Sonichu and Chris from the chat, as well as time and space. It's not explicitly stated in the book, but I'ma just go ahead and say this what causes all the retcons to happen in this issue, because there'll be a lot. So Russia wins the Cold War and makes the US a puppet state, and then Hillary Clinton wins the 2016 election, and then Hillary gets sick, and then Putin steps in, and then Brendan Fraser becomes the new mayor of Quickville, and then the Yakuza and Russian Mafia fight over territory in Quickville, and then Ian Brandon Anders something 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 happens, just a lot of random shit happening. It's kind of hard to keep track of, especially since there are two Chris's now, modern Chris and classic Chris. Apparently after Megan Schroeder wronged him, he revoked- hold up, hold up, run that back, run that back. Wronged him? Wronged him? For not wanting to be subject to his rape fantasy drawings? Wronged him? Are you fucking kidding me, you goddamn spoon? <laughs> Okay, so as I was saying before I had to take a half hour to process the fuckboy level 100 concentrate I just read, Classic Chris revoked women's rights around the same time she transitioned. So Modern Chris and John pull up and jump Classic Chris. Then, all of a sudden, for no reason, Nightstar royally fucks up and accidentally makes an ass load of Chris clones. So now we got dozens of the horny little bastards just running around, touching people inappropriately at conventions until they get kicked out and curled into a ball. Classic Chris is then converted to like seven different edgy ideologies, before some Muslim guy just shoves a Sonichu medallion up his ass to make him less lustful. I know I'd personally get soft if someone yelled God is good before shoving chunks of Griola fucking model magic up my shrektum. You know, I don't particularly swing that way. So modern Chris learns she is a Sonichu God born of the chaotic rainbow and part Part of the ancient prophecy, and therefore denounces Christianity. This, I guess, causes the chaotic combo to go under the most try-hard, unfunny edgelord retcons wise could possibly come up with. Again, just like Bananasaur. Damn, bro, you got the whole squad laughing. I mean, the, the shit's real annoying. It's just like, <laughs> well, thought you know, we do here in bubbles identified as the black man. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! I guess the only one that's kind of entertaining is Rosichu being trans. Apparently, she happened to be a boy back when she was a Raichu. So now, all that raging over Rosichu pickle picks was all for nothing. DJ jamps to Sonic is then taken to trial for molesting punchy Sonichu and Tails. Chris manages to get DJ Jamsta acquitted, which kind of causes riots to break out in the city for, you know, <laughs> obstruction of justice. Weakening Quickville's defenses enough for Australatina, a neighboring country, to just kind of attack. Apparently they were at conflict with Quickville because a soldier took a massive dumpy on the border. Since this be like the fifth war to break out within the week, Quickville's demolished and split into two halves, just like Berlin in after World War II. And speaking of World War II, and then Nazis, cause why not? They go around clubbing all the Pokemon for no fucking reason. And now Chris and a gaggle of different characters like Discord have to go around killing Nazis. 100 dead Nazis! Chris uses her blood to melt the Nazis, but it only kinda works, causing some of the Nazis to turn into Sonichus themselves. The Nazi Sonichus then kidnap the special 69 Sonichus, as well as build Rosichu rape camps to forcefully mate with kidnapped Rosichus and one sec. Hold up. I'm getting a call. Hello? What's that? 
Oh, I'm just being informed that we have officially read the stupidest thing to ever happen in Sonichu lore. Our consolation prize being a copy of Super Troopers on VHS. Okay, so remember Silvana Rosichu? Well, she kind of died, like, just now while waiting for someone to rescue her from Monica. And I guess Neptune just a skeleton at this point. But apparently Sonichus are like phoenixes in that they resurrect immediately after dying, so she comes back as a Sonny. Robert Chandler also comes back as a Sonny and teams up with Ted Bundy, who is a Sonny as well, and they become the new defenders of Quickvit. I said it before and I'll say it again, this be one of Quick's many unhealthy coping mechanisms to deal with real life. Nightstar gets her tail cut off or something, so Chris turns her into a half pony, half Sonichu, and oh my god, what the hell is that killer with fire? John Yamada and Chris then return to Castle Dushenstein, kill all the Nazis, and then liberate the captured Rosichus. The Nazis are then disbanded because they're all different types of Sonichus, so now they can't really unite under one identity anymore. You know, except Sonichus. The Rosichus then lay the eggs of their Nazi rapists, and they all hatch into healthy Sonnies. Yay, I guess. <laughs> Chris then goes on like a page-long tangent, bitching because John Yamada is like fake flexing all this pussy he getting on IG. Alright, so apparently this entire time, Magichan just been loving it up with his pseudo-father figure Mewtwo since Sylvana died. So now they're gay, I guess. Magichan then has a mental breakdown, I guess from reading Sonichu issue 13, and it causes a rift to tear through reality. Chris seals the big hole in the sky, and they take Magichan to scoop out chunks of his brain and replace him with machinery, kinda like in Cruelty Squad, to calm him the fuck down. Only he don't get any cool eye turrets, what a rip. Christine scolds Magichan for daring to have a mental breakdown over things that are beyond his control, and then forgives him and kisses Magichan and promises to marry him. And this is totally not an abusive relationship, you guys. Chris is now married to like five different people simultaneously, cause it's Chris. Sonichu then has a mental breakdown of his own, and is about to go on a spree killing in game industry with the goal of murdering all the CPU goddesses with a single pistol. Chris confronts Sonichu, and it's the most natural conversation you'll ever read in your entire life. My son, my son, please come back to me. You are not this. You are not a war making and hateful thing. You are Sonichu. I love you, my son. Mwah. I promise I'll have sex with you later, Sonichu. Oh no, you don't. You got me too turned on for me to let you go without sex now. Now come here, you woman. I always get what I want. <laughs> What the fuck is this? <laughs> oh, god damn. <laughs> this issue's so bad, it's giving me an asthma attack. So Chris ties up Sonichu's horny ass. I don't know if that'll turn him on less or not. I have no idea. The issue ends with Chris going back in time to retcon the retcons of this issue, and the United States is back to normal. Yay. And then we have that big massive fuck off wedding where Chris marries like seven people at once and that's the end and thank god oh my god this one was so bad this one was so bad this was an endurance round man reading this shit felt like playing cruelty squad after getting a lobotomy and being punched really hard in the boob so you know Fuck this issue. <laughs> Next episode finna be the finale of the Sonichu review series. Because as of now, I believe issue 13 is the last finished issue of Sonichu. The rest is just a bunch of like, unfinished chunks of nothing. So yeah, this is the penultimate video for the Sonichu review. After that, we're done. I'ma think of something fun to cap things off with. But until then, welcome to Club Doom where I, uh, I, I kind of wanted to do something a little different for the finale of the Sonichu review series. That's right, we at the end. And I kind of wanted to use this video to give my uh, final thoughts on this crazy ass webcomic that has somehow managed to bring us all together. I wanted this last stream to be the end, but we only got through issue 14 because some stupid thunderstorm ruined the stupid stream. But as far as the actual issues go, there's, there ain't really much to talk about. Cause like, number one, they ain't even finished. Issues 14, 15, and 16 are all just jumbled pages of incomplete nonsense. Hell, issue 17's just a front cover and that it. And I ain't see Chris Chan finishing them Johns anytime soon. They kind of too busy being incarcerated at the moment. Number two, the themes and stories of issues 15 and 16. How, how do I put this? Uh, 
would be better suited for videos unrelated to this review series, if that makes sense. Like, issue 15 is simply a retelling of a parody comic called Rosa Chew's Story, where Chris essentially just takes that comic, and by take that comic, I mean like, practically tracing over it and yoinking out all the little parts they didn't like, i.e. anything that made them look bad. So in my mind, it would just make sense to make a separate review on Rosa Chew's story and then like compare the two. And then we got issue 16, which is a completely different mess in that it is an actual mess. Chris deadass spilled paint all over the shit and then sold the fucked up pages on eBay or something before never working on the comic again, which sounds like a very Chris thing to do. And it about the backstory of Count Graduate one. So like, yeah, that might as well be a quickie quickie on Count Graduan himself, as opposed to like, just a, you know, like a two minute video on this like three pager. Also, am I alone in thinking Count Graduan low key got a badass backstory? Dude fought in the Hundred Year War and put a curse on himself after being mortally wounded by a French soldier so that he may one day return, forever reincarnating destined to fight in countless wars until the end of time to the point that war and conflict is all the man knows. Like, bruh, that unironically a badass backstory for a villain. And in typical quick fashion, soon as Chris thinks of something genuinely cool, they immediately pull the plug and, like, the issue's just unfinished forever. And then that's it. After that, uh, you know, Chris basically went on Twitter one day to explain how they wrote 300 additional issues of Sonichu in another universe, and until the dimensional merge happened, we ain't seen shit. And hell, Chris in jail and saying the dimensional merge has already happened, and we still ain't get 300 additional pages of Sonichu. So that's the end. You know, fuck you like shit. But you know what? It's kind of fitting that Sonichu ain't got an end in the same way Monty Python's Holy Grail ain't really got a satisfying end. Because it was never meant to. The shit ain't like Infinity Train, where there was an obvious direction they were going before HBO Max just pulled the plug because the company run by soulless corporate husks pretending to be human. Nah, bruh, from the jump, Sonichu was always meant to be an excessive power fantasy for the author who can't really handle real life. Just straight up cope in comic book form. Which is why it's so goddamn funny. Cause back in the day when this John first dropped, people were already familiar with bad Sonic the Hedgehog fanfics filled with horny, self-insert wish fulfillment characters. But they were always relatively tame and at least stayed within the boundaries of the Sonic universe for the most part. Then comes in this fat dipshit who puts himself in the comic as well as his Pokemon self-insert fan character venting about how he got kicked out of Target for abusing the soda fountain while trying to hit on chicks. The drawing bad, the paneling bad, there's misspellings and grammar mistakes all over the goddamn place. It, like, it feel like a parody. And then when you come to realize Oh yeah, the author being deadass and is just as deranged as the comic he drop in. You soon come to realize it serves more than one purpose. It is also an autobiographical case study of one of the most deranged individuals to ever grace the internet. So would I recommend Sonichu, the electric hedgehog Pokemon? <laughs> No, I recommend you watch these videos, motherfucker. Give me them views and likes type beat. It's been a wild ride, but I believe now it is time. Finally put this review series to rest. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy uh, our future endeavors when we move on to shit like Aspertu, Tales Gets Trolled, and all other kinds of wacky nonsense. I most surely, sincerely hope uh, you enjoyed this, uh, this little journey we went on. And I hope to catch you in the later journeys. Cause uh, you know, this Club Doom train ain't stopping. We we gon we gonna have a lot of interesting shit to talk about. Sweet nectar. Welcome to Club Doom, where y'all really thought it was over, huh? Nah, playboy. We still got the Sonichu specials. From what I can tell, Chris drew these comics at the request of various sweethearts over the years, all of whom turned out to be trolls. I know, shocking. I heard these some of the funniest ones out to yourself. Get psyched. Clyde Cash be bald, looking more like a Joe Rogan made in Soul Calibur than Lee Hottie. And what with these Sonichu villains rocking these fabulous purple capes? Like, dude, I kinda want one. Anyway, Ka kidnaps Troll Sona number 49877, codenamed Ivy, and it up to Chris and Sonichu to save her. Okay, maybe just Chris. Cause Sonichu, the homie comic named after, maybe in like one panel, two if you count the blur here. Clyde gets splatted against the wall while Chris frees Ivy. So 
Aang trying to dip, but Clyde be like, Oh, y'all really thought you ate, huh? And start chasing him in a jet pack. Bro, say, why did I ever doubt you? But then Chris just kind of turn around and spray his ass. Pause. Chris then takes off his shirt so he can use a different shirt that he wasn't wearing as a flag. So, like, why even take off the first shirt from the jump. I don't know. There's some inconsistencies with this comic. From what I heard, only some of the pages were ever linked. You can find more, but they only on the holding out for a hero video. It's just Chris and Ivy's wedding, honestly. Not really much going on here except Coach McGurk, Ivy's dad, apparently, and Ching Chong, the flower girl. <laughs> That's a great throwback. Yeah, who remembered Ching Chong? She the supposed little Chinese girl trolls convinced Chris he traumatized with the infamous Fanta video. Uh, previous video was also dedicated to a little girl who accidentally found the ED page. Her name was Ching Chong. There's some sneak dissing at Sarah Hammer's expense, and yeah, that's really it. <laughs> I, how, how do I put this without getting demonetized? I got it. Ivy transforms into her Sonichu Sona because in an epic M. Night Shyamalan twist, it revealed her booty cheeks are secret jerk-off double agents. So like any jerk-offs, Chris gotta beat him up using the sacred pipe, a mystical Cherokee weapon passed down the generations. Now, Chris wanted to depict this weapon as realistic as possible. So in his infinite wisdom, he, uh, laid the pipe, if you will on the paper and traced around it, making it look comically large. The release of this comic was met with disgust and concern, but mostly concern, as it revealed how said pipe bends at an awkward 150 degree angle for no reason. <laughs> and I've been laughing at this for a straight 40 minutes nonstop, so let's just move on to the next one. So Solid Chris, aka Ian Brandon Anderson, on his way to rescue Casey from Liquid. Except he only going 65 miles an hour. So I guess it's not too big a deal. I won't go 65 and save Casey within the line. Upon confronting Liquid, Ian pulls out the blicky and shoots out his kneecaps. What you say? As if this is a normal thing that regularly happens in the Sonichu comics. Then Casey's father congratulates Ian for a job well done. I'm sure that's difficult for some of y'all to imagine given the Casey father calls. I, this one really short. So I'ma just read you the quickie article. Special 5 was a comic Chris had created on April 18th, 2018. Only a single page of this comic was shared by the captain, which depicts Chris giving his anethyst ring to the captain. Summary. Chris, wearing the Gopnik outfit, gathers all but 0.01% of the amethyst ring's power to himself. He then entrusts the class ring to the captain, while Magichan, Krizel, Sonichu, and Rosichu sadly look on in the background. The captain then thanks Chris and says he will take care of the ring. Due to Chris's ego, he then has the captain close out the comic by saying, you provide good service to us all in this world. Oh yeah, Chris definitely providing good service, considering the tugboat, I like to call it state-sponsored entertainment. Text! Text! Whole lot of text! Oh my god! It just like Sonichu Season 2, bro. I don't want to read all this. Look at this. Y'all really want me to read this to you? I know y'all don't. It four pages where Chris bitching to Dr. Wolf about getting blocked by bronies on Twitter. Do y'all really want me to read that? Y'all really want me to read that? I, 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 I can read it for you. I can read it for you. I realize these pages are being read by other creators who still connect. Yeah, you don't want me to read this. I don't want to be here. Magichan look like he don't want to be here. Dr. Wolf look like he having a stroke. Yeah, we moving on. So Special 7 basically consists of Chris, Jack, and Ben Saint's comic and changing events to go the way they wanted them to go. And you know what? Good. 
Ben Saint. Dude straight up be the definition of an annoying clout chasing ween. All my homies hate Ben Saint. If you're real curious what go on in these, I'll tell you. In Ben Saint's comics, some goo fucks shit up. The end. In Chris's canon, Chris Chan Sonichu arrives, clowns the two OCs for being awful Ben Saint OCs. The goo comes back, they test it in a lab, and the results show this Chris version of events be less annoying than Ben Saint. And those, the specials. Thus finally concludes the full Sonichu canon. Or at least the oh. people care about on my channel. So I guess we gotta move on. Who knows what great adventures await us post Sonichu. Will we look at Tails Gets Trolled? Will we look at Empress Teresa? It ain't really a weird internet phenomenon, but I'm always down to look at Baki. Who knows? Until then, and I will catch y'all the next time. Sweet Nectar. Shout out Bravo Jester, shout out Fox Azure, Average Citrus User, and Dress Hold On, J Avarice, JX Bermudez, and Boom Chicka Pow, Chicka Boom Taratada, Scale is Gizems, and Cape Town, you know it is, all over y'all, Stone of Kabuk, on all platforms, and Evil the Cat will be my best work. So check it out, check it out when it drops, check it out.